Hello everyone, today we talk about Celtic tactics between, let's say, the second half of the 4th century and the mid-2nd century BC. So it's a pretty long time span in which Celtic society as a world transformed, like with also considering uh, how far it, it stretched, um, territorially speaking, and how it diversified uh, itself in the process. But uh, at the same time, there are certain essentials that can be observed in Celtic tactics as a whole, right? And always being aware that we are talking about this mm, general frame of martial peculiarities of a group of populations that we do configure today as the Celts that are dispersed uh, largely in Europe and, and not all, right? And we how much these people fundamentally differentiated their own characteristics in, in the conduct of war um, in within all the um, uncountable tribes that composed it um, is not certain, right? Simply because we don't have enough sources, we don't have them even for the Romans, right? Many people think we actually know how the Romans practically fought, all their tactics, every single detail. Actually, we know very few about it in the first place, and, act and we are very lucky that uh, Hellenic and Roman historiography um, looked at these Central European populations and said, okay, you know, let's talk about them and let's observe them, and naturally this uh, gave rise to a historiography that has to be taken with more than a grain of salt, right? And a lot of controversial mm, attitudes towards these topics also arise uh, in popular culture because of certain ideological stands that are either pro-Celtic or pro-Roman, so all these uh, idiocies that frankly I don't think it's even worth to discuss, but just be aware that um, there is a, a, a huge um, uh, difficulty and uh, a, a, actually a huge interest in first place um, to portray such world in, in ways that are essentially the reflections of a lot of things we, we think today um, historically incorrectly we could say uh, but at the same time we have very big difficulties from a strictly historical point of view right? to really understand what these peoples were um, and definitely, uh, we are not talking about the, uh, you know, crude, evil mm, barbarians that, you know, essentially represent in a world upside down from in compared to civilization. But at the same time, we have also to be correct in framing these peoples in the way they were, that were substantially more primitive populations that had this tribal clientelly structure. And we don't have to force parallelisms or comparisons like saying those things like that the, the Romans stole uh, Celtic civilization and annihilated because there are a lot of people who actually reason like this. It, this, this is sheer conspiracy theory. There is nothing historical about it. It's just a, a gross um, uh, over mystification of small you know, hints that we have about the fact that, of course, um, the Romans weren't that gentle, of course, with what they did with the Celts, there were uh, brutal massacres and, and annihilations, there were lots of peoples that, you know, today we don't even know the name of because the Romans raised them to, to the ground, but we don't have to think that there was a parallel you know, civilization to Greek and Rome it was magically wiped out and, you know, uh, the Mediterranean historiographers mm, cancelled everything. Because there are people who literally think, there's, I said, there is a lot of hatred generally when talk, discussing about uh, these topics. And I fundamentally, I can't even comprehend why, right? I understand that there are certain people that project... Um, say the fact that they, they pretend that these were their ancestors and they try to eliminate every other possible um, you know intruder as they say uh, they see them evidently from from the, their picture and stressing this alleged uh, purity and you know uh, romantic view poetic view of the Celtic world these were uh, brutal martyrs as much as the Romans like the only difference they were talking about a world that simply functioned like that I mean, in the ancient world, there wasn't much of a different ethical system aside from I'm stronger than you, hence I have the right to conquer you, right? The difference be between the Celts and the Romans is that the Romans were more advanced and managed to do that with better means, right? And also offering, in a way, some margin f for 
you know, still, you know, not literally annihilating, right? We, we often forget that the Celtic world was somewhat integrated in the Roman one. It wasn't a total annihilation, right? Everybody's loader and just the Roman, uh, you know, spreading. Um, it wasn't like that. And the Celts actually heavily contributed to the same uh, Roman Empire in ways that um, are actually very important and overlooked and that uh, also show the continuity of Celtic culture by, you know, modified within the Roman world and even the persistency of some, you know, uh, isles of, not really of Celtic culture to cook, let's say, but uh, at least of areas that were relatively superficially Romanized and kept being, you know, somewhat um, the, the way that it had been. Also, this is this gets ideological because of, of many tricks that are done, such as saying, you know, uh, the Romans at one point began to persecute the Druids. Well, yes, given that the Druids were those who were actively prosecuting, even across the channel, um, the resistance against Rome, and this was definitely something that, you know, even if it happened today, would lead to similar consequences. Um, and, um, yeah, but it's not that the Romans had a specific hatred towards the Celts. Actually, we, ha we are plenty of evidence that in late Roman times, especially after the, the conquest of Gaul, uh, I mean, individuals like Cicero, for example, leaving aside Caesar, they interacted with them uh, on a regular basis, but even Augustus had contacts with Celts and also with Druids, right? And it was a pretty interesting, um, you know, dialogue between these uh, cultures, and not everything has to be seen just as, you know, a pure... Um, evil or annihilation or colonialism seen through the moral filter 2,000 years later, right? So, aside from this introduction that I always need to do when we talk about Celtic history because it seems that, you know, I, I don't want this channel to turn into something like uh, I talk about a specific people, hence I'm, you know, making propaganda in favor or against a certain others, right? And it, this is... Um, particularly important to to understand as I, I haven't haven't found many you know let's say historically objective contents out there and I think that in by 2020 this is uh, an insult to the dignity of human civilization but aside from this um, talking about tactics today is is quite important because it, it makes you reflect on how homogeneous and this is also another thing we often stress on Schwer, but actually these tactics in the ancient world, especially in these tribal calendarly uh, populations, uh, actually were, right? We have great problems to even define what the Celts were, right? Um, they, uh, I'm not going to discuss now if they, they self-identified in the way we, we, we think they should have done, uh, and that's a badly posed question in the first place. I mean, I, I'm, I've made some videos about the Germans regarding this, for example, in realizing that, yeah, I mean, you don't need to self-identify explicitly. We're talking about 2,000 years ago, even more. Like, what's the chance of finding, um, you know, um, a datum like that from a largely literate uh, population, right? It doesn't even make sense. And I think that every people, in a way, self-identifies. And if there actually were, as there were, some broad, maybe loose linguistical or religious and cultural traits in common, it's possible that these peoples realized that. But this still hasn't anything to do with thinking that there was something like a unique Celtic, um, you know, identity that that's totally unhistorical as well. And I say this because actually um, m many people rightfully say that differences such as the one between the Celts and the Germans are essentially um, are Hellenic and Roman um, historiographical creation, um, which is fair um, to say, uh, always given that there were somehow certain different waves in which these populations um, transformed and that look at the same uh, Latin culture, the Hallstatt culture before it, um, also how the, the Germans arrived later, and, and there are certain stages that can help you in that regard to, to see the differences in there. Naturally, we don't have to believe every single thing ancient historians say, because most of the times it's, um, it's not much that is 
wrong but it's mediated from their cultural perspective and there are plenty of studies about these issues but these sources are still dramatically precious because very far actually from showing you know a, a largely just negative picture uh, of the way it's it's mostly modern people that, that read a, mo um, a kind of a negative stigma attached to the descriptions in ancient uh, historiography towards the Celts or the Germans actually uh, even if you look at Caesar that massacred a hell of a lot of them. Um, you know, he, the, the worst, the, the, his political agenda was to show uh, the Roman Senate that the Gauls were actually uh, integrable populations, that they had a sense of, you know, common sense, a shared sense of honor and, and of pride and also of mm, civilization uh, that could be profitably, uh, you know, framed within the, the Roman the Roman Empire and uh, in, in, in a civil participation sense, I mean this had happened already with Cisalpine and Gaul etc. Uh, let's also be very aware that even those ethnical stereotypes, especially the Romans were so fond of, were built up in saying things like you know uh, stressing, I don't know, the physical differences like these guys is tall, blonde, the Romans short, dark, right? Th that was something the Romans were very proud about, actually, because it showed their moral superiority, it was designed to prove that point, that even if you look at anthropometrically at these populations, I mean, they were pretty damn similar um, in many ways, especially the Atlantic populations were s that we called as Celts were largely, actually, not descendants of the Celtic invaders, uh, but essentially they had culturally Celticized and it seems that you know the average Celt even it doesn't mean much actually it was like 1.7 meters tall on, on average like it, which is fairly a lot for the time um, the italics were somewhat shorter but you know not so much just some inches fundamentally and this whole idea that even the Romans and the Celts were so different so and it's another myth that is fueled exactly by those who want to oppose this clash of civilizations that didn't actually happen as such at the time um, and in fact uh, even if you look the linguistically speaking and ba basically the uh, you know the Roman second declension is it's basically the same of the Celtic one, right? Uh, that that this sometimes the same words, the same etymologies, right? The words peoples that, aside from the fact that the Celts arrived, you know, pretty close, you know, occupying areas of northern and central Italy, but uh, you know, simply realizing that there wasn't such a great difference at the base, that these were fundamentally populations coming largely from uh, the same culture, at least the dominating cultures of of the conquerors that had settled you know from from central europe back in you know uh, during the in proto indo european times if you want shared a lot right and we will see this especially in other videos that we are already done right and in which you basically see different stages of development and that's also where it it, it is incomprehensible to me when i hear and read about things like that that there was a sort of watershed between uh, Central and Southern Europe, and it, it's completely it's complete nonsense, right? But aside from this, um, the point here is that there, there were effective differences in at the levels of of development, right? You can't say uh, either that uh, the Romans were the same thing of the Celts or that the Celts civilized the Italics, or things like like this, because if anything, it was the other way around, right? And yes civilization also does pass through exterminations unfortunately um, and that's something that history has showed us pretty damn well right the, the level of civilization of people does not is, is not inversely pr in, inversely proportional to the uh, destructive capabilities right and how they are used and this is not just uh, you know the Roman historians try to to obscure Celtic civilization. No, it, it, we're, we know that from archaeology massively. I mean, we, we recognize uh, overwhelmingly uh, well that, you know, certain populations of Central and Northern Europe were far behind in terms of development, right? And um, even if they, you know, were more ahead on, I don't know, think about the famous chain mail or 
metallurgy. I mean, even the Sarmatians were far ahead uh, than the Celts to them, but we don't think that the Sarmatians were, you know, such a developed civilization, and, you know, the Mediterranean was just, you know, um, being uh, at an equal level, right? Th there are obvious hierarchies, and if you don't recognize them historically speaking, you we're going to have a very serious problem because that's what our civilization today, which has incredibly and radically sophisticated means of historical inquiry, um, shows us without any shadow of, of a doubt. So um, to insist on these uh, readings, it's uh, first of all, it's stupid and ignorant. Uh, but in, in the second place, um, it's also an insult to the people that uh, someone tries to magnify because you're essentially denying the historical reality that lay behind them. Right? It's not that if the Romans were more advanced, you know, the Celts had to suck. This is um, a, basically a crypto, if not openly racist, ideology that developed in you know cer certain parts of the world in the mid 19th century that ever since has obsessed a large amount of, of the Western world in saying, you know, if a population is more advanced, they're, they're, they're superior and the others are just a bunch of barbarians, right? If anything, the problem is you today in the 21st century reasoning still like that. The Celts were what they were because they were, uh, they existed in a specific context and uh, they wouldn't have sense in a different context. So the comparison between civilizations is not a race between who is the best and, and who you have to take most pride for. That's what a 12 years old killed with crazy hormones is, is obsessed by. A healthy adult, a psychologically healthy adult, is a person who simply reads this history and is able to say, okay, well, we have this evidence, we have to realize things were in this way. So if you're a Celtic fanboy, as much as you're a Roman fanboy, and you pretend to find in this channel uh, a support to your uh, you know, delusions uh, go away. Because here we talk about history and not about the world of fantasy that many adults also live in, probably to cope with their personal faders or I don't know what. Um, aside from this, talking about Celtic tactics is, is fascinating, right? Because what I was saying before is essentially look at the Germans, right? And you don't see much of a difference, right? When you look at European mm, trial warfare, um, in this time, you see that the essentials are pretty much the same. Hell, even if you look at where Rome basically emerged from, very far from being a sort of copy of the Greeks, was essentially a tribal, a military tribal culture, and actually shared a dramatic lot with the Celtic world. Even if you look at the, I don't know, an Italic panoply of the 5th, even the 4th century BC, basically the same weapons the Celts used. Right, uh, in terms of of comparison, they had different maybe forms, different um, you know they came from different backgrounds, but the essentials of having, for example, this large um, you know this pierce with very large blade and um, which is apt for very sophisticated uh, fence and swords of eighty even one hundred centimeters long. It's something you find among you know the, the Celts as much as the the Italics, etc. Other populations of far north, the Germans are still somewhat in, you know, they, they have to enter the, the Iron Age proper. I mean, the, there is a, it's very interesting indeed to see how um, the Celts emanate this uh, effectively military culture, especially metallurgical one, um, and, and a question one also by, by some degree, which, of course, did influence even Roman military culture and uh, the one of, of the Germans, right? You, what you see also in the late empire, in, uh, in talking about the continuity and the legacy of the Celtic world in the Romano-Germanic armies is an astonishing amount of Celtic a legacy of, you know, devices, you know, the technologies in some form. Yet we have to frame them correctly in a world that didn't go beyond a certain stage of, of development, right? It basically, the most advanced areas of the Celtic world were the ones of central and southern Gaul that were more exposed um, to the Mediterranean civilizations and wealth, and they had um, more stratified and complex societies, right? And and this also partly, in fact, um, you know, increased their uh, that got closer, for example, to you know they they went into proto urbanization in some form.
something very modest after all, but uh, that's a somewhat an exception that you can find many other hill forts, the so-called opida by the Latins, uh, scattered all over Central Europe especially. And, and this based trade net of relations, but let's be honest about it, th these are still largely primitive populations. There are isles, you hear it's not even a geographical thing, uh, there are areas that are very close to each other in which there are astonishing differences in the level of development, etc. And this will be very important also to, let's say, to channel the uh, Roman the Roman expansion, right? You know, the, the so-called Celtic uh, road network uh, helped greatly the same Romans invading Gaul, for example. And um, this mm, concrete mm, centralization around certain opida uh, was also a way to, you know, to manage better the area. Gaul has been, uh, say, it's an, e an easy area to, to control once you have... You, you've conquered it exactly because of this pattern, even in the Middle Ages, but even you know during World War II, because of this specific you know political, uh, social, infrastructural articulation of the territory that does have uh, a Celtic, a Celtic legacy. But the point is that uh, differently from how pe certain people think, also because they largely interpret some sources, um, the uh, military models of the Mediterranean world fundamentally didn't. Uh, invest the uh, the Celt Celtic warfare as a wall, right? Even when you see, I don't know, these big centers like Marseille in southern uh, France, and you, you realize that as it happened basically with all the other Greek colonies ar uh, around the Mediterranean, that their, their political and social models didn't go much far inland than, I don't know, 30 kilometers, right? And this Continental proper areas of Europe have, have always developed, uh, retained, as, uh, f even f f uh, throughout processes, m more incisive processes like the one of Romanization, a certain specific agricultural, pastoral uh, the character that you know has survived even I in the Middle Ages, uh, and so on. Um, that is to say that Celtic warfare in this regard is pretty homogeneous. There are not sensible differences. Right between the uh, Celtic populations during uh, these centuries. At the same time, Celtic warfare, however, underwent some transformation. Many people, as you'll see now, place a lot of emphasis on the so-called heroic um, character, you know, of Celtic warfare. Right, but technically, you know, in in the immediate pre-Roman times, actually. The heroic Eddas in the wide Celtic world actually survived more or less only in Britain, right? Uh, we should stress that the uh, heroic combat in the common Homeric exception in reality has never existed, right? Um, just like it will happen again in the Middle Ages that the heroes were always accompanied by a retinue and the duels were the exception, not the rule, right? Um, so even if you look at the Celtic world as well, there, there were areas that, you know, the Celts occupied fairly populous areas. I mean, if you think about the Gaul um, as such, I mean, those were some of the, the, the richest and more populated areas of entire Europe. Um, certain regions of Spain were like that, even certain parts of the Danubian, a few part of the Danubian area, but uh, th these were somewhat in, at the, um, in between the, the really very fertile Mediterranean world and those areas that effectively even the Romans will never occupy because they were not economically profitable, right? And that's why even if you look at Britain, for example, essentially the Romans settled in what had been Celtic Britain proper, right? If the far north was somewhat something uh, not so different, but still had not enough requisites for you know Roman colonialism to eff effectively take root. And you also have to wonder what was the the goal in the first place to settle uh, permanently in a certain place where you effectively rule the entire world already. And the empire is also something that is not strictly territorial, but it's also based chiefly based on the military de deterrent as such. Um, so we should get used to focus also on this other important areas. Uh, today, for example, we will not talk about the Celtiberians. They're actually very fascinating, albeit much of what we will say today about the Celts, you know, loosely fit certain areas of the Iberian Peninsula, 
uh, at this time but there are really certain Celts that are forgotten. About the Galatians we, we know a bit more if anything because Hellenic historiography was somewhat prolific about them but there is also this massive um, you know chain of the so-called Danubian Celts for example that, for example, that um, do not get enough credit and were instead some of the most fascinating and important and also very tough populations at that time. I mean, in, in order to, to take down the Pannonians, I mean, the, the Romans had to commit tens of imperial uh, legions. I mean, it was a, these were massive operations, even the Cantabrians in, in the north of Spain. I mean, those are parts of this Celtic world that um, are actually uh, forgotten for some historiographical reason, indeed, but even if you look at the Gauls themselves, they are by far the most important Celts, historically speaking, right, given their relevance. Well, they, they also do not get enough credit uh, recognition. I mean, they're actually um, very fascinating. But I would like to start effectively from this er whole heroic Eddas thing and where it starts from, right? So, uh, first of all, we have to realize that, uh, I don't know, if you start from the 5th or the 4th century BC, naturally the Celtic world at this point is still very, uh, first of all, is more primitive than it, than it was later on, right? Especially when it had, you know, been influenced chiefly from terms of material culture, not in, its, in their political and social structures by the Mediterranean world. We will see this better when we talk about the weapons that were employed in here because... Uh, many people are convinced that you know if you use a certain weapon, it's because you must forcefully fight uh, in a certain style that is where that weapon comes from, right? Uh, this is actually largely wrong, and that's why great part of ancient warfare is actually misunderstood largely because of this, and that's why we also we are so obsessed about this idea of the coping, right? Of cultural appropriation is one of the, the greatest garbage I've ever heard. Um, there is no pride in that, in stating something like that whatsoever, because if a people is able to integrate something from another population, that's, that's called civilization, effectively. And guess what? Why? We were talking about the Romans as more developed, right? Not because they were weak by stealing other people's cultures, but because they had a freaking political and social system that allowed them to absorb the best of other peoples and creating an original synthesis that allowed, in fact, to achieve what no other people out there had ever accomplished. Um, but that's another thing we will discuss in another video. We have already discussed partly, at least, uh, in other videos. But the idea is that, you know, the Celts from 400 BC loosely begin this massive, uh, you know, uh, the, the Latin period, if I'm not wrong, starts roughly between the mid-5th century. So by that time, actually, the Celts begin to expand from this Central European area. We're talking uh, chiefly about what would be today's um, southern Germany, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Switzerland. You know, parts of the Rhine Valley, and eventually expand all, all around, right? And actually, the movements of these peoples are, are very difficult to track previously to, to this. Uh, I mean, the, if you take even the the, my, the Celtic migrations in Britain, you realize that there were waves that went on for for centuries, like there were Celts far deep in, into, you know, I don't know, the north of Britain, let's say, that had somewhat assimilated also with the previous populations. So other, look at the other Celts uh, that were coming, I don't know, in the second century BC as, you know, complete foreigners, like they, they shared something with them, but even here, what does Celt mean in the first place? But it's fascinating because, however, from 400 BC, you have this mass migrations that are quite important. They arrive up to, especially in Italy, um, Northern Italy, the, uh, the Danubian area, they arrive as far as Asia Minor. As far as I understand, the um, also it was the Celtization of, of Gaul, and as far as I understand, the, the Iberian Peninsula, more than seeing massive Celtic migrations in them, was so a process of sort of Celtization. Now I don't want to enter into the, 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 their culture in part, largely, by the way, uh, because th there is a great impact in there, but uh, there's also this blending with local, you know, military customs and a certain kind of original synthesis in there. But as we said once again, that we will leave that for another um, dedicated video. Um, but I mean, it's a huge area, right? And that's where the Celts also get better known by the the Greeks, by the Romans, who start writing and fighting actually uh, 
uh, about, I mean, respectively about, uh, with them. Um, so what's the idea? Well, is, is that uh, if you look at migrations largely in tribal cultures, is that you have a phase in which essentially these populations are hungry, right? For some systemic reason, they ha they are many. They don't have enough land, so they, they go out and search for it. This is also the Indo-European migrations in a nutshell, right? This had happened also for, I don't know, for the same Greeks, for the same Italics, for the same... Uh, what would happen for the Germans in the same way. Um, the point is that there are the sort of waves for which these populations have, you know, it, it takes a lot of motivation to leave your land, to go out there, and especially in territories that are populated by others, right? So these are migrations, but also invasions, right? It's always somewhat uh, the same way you can interpret it. Um, and you, uh, especially in these contexts, um, and it, we, we're not justifying any side in here. The point is to stress the fact that you need to fight true, right? So your your culture has to revolve largely in this kind of cinematic fashion around this uh, quite heavily militarized models, right, that are also very complicated to explain as long as think about the difference in Germanic world between the Zip and the Comitatus, right? But there is a moment in which effectively these uh, migrations in all their complexity succeed, these people settle down, they mix with the locals, and they organize uh, the societies in a more complex way. This is the, co the case of the Gauls, for example, uh, right? And the, in this previous phase, though, the, that's where the point, that there's not a huge difference, I don't know, what, what the Germans will be before, right? We're somewhat similar, we're cousins. Um, they shared a similar edus, and this initial edus is proper of a very mm, poorly stratified society, um, that, however, in its oligarchies has this uh, over-reliance on the individual, right? The idea that the chief name is not just a charismatic figure or someone with a freaking lot of money, but it has to be individually a military hero, right? Why? Because these societies are so simple at this point that effectively the only way for them to succeed is to have a chief that is a single person who is individually directly committed to the fight Right, so we're talking about even certain processes of selection because, I mean, this idea that these guys had been were taller, more muscular, and stereotypically so for the Mediterranean populations is also probably due to the fact that they had, you know, to survive in tougher environments in the first place. Not much the weather, I presume, but the, the same shortage of resources that led these tribes to basically kill each other over and over again and that was a pretty tough situation in which uh, you know you really forge uh, a, a tribally military culture as we have seen the same Romans had been fundamentally about that and don't think that even at the time of the fourth century when they met with the Celts and were defeated um, on the Alia River, they were that far from that model yet. The Romans had a, uh, you know, a, probably one of the speediest um, process of civilization ever, right? They, they passed from a semi-tribal uh, society to a heroic society in many ways. The Roman clans were essentially feudal clientels. It was the same identical thing. Look at the panoply of Italic warriors, what they were. And you will realize what the, even the striking similarities, as we were saying, with the Celts. And it passed to this major expert, which also explains, by the way, why Rome was effectively a militarized state in many ways, right? Eventually civilized, but its essentials remained long, for very long, culturally speaking, all about war, about the conquest, about this divine mandate, which was actually even in here, shared by these other populations, right? The, the Celts, uh, like other tribal peoples, believed effectively that the uh, celestial deities m conferred them a glory that in their life they had naturally to to be worth of by being m proud and, uh, you know, and, and loyal and fanatically so, by the way, and great warriors and therefore deserving it, right? And um, leaving this relation with war, especially in afterlife, in, in exactly in the key, right? And this was, even if they didn't know that, probably, uh, that because they had interiorized it so much without rationalizing, it was, from a moral point of view, the only way to cope with the hellish world they effectively lived in, right? Um, this is especially true at the beginning, right? The, the idea that the Celts were really, initially, these rough, tough, brutal, 
cruel, fierce, proud invaders that came uh, raising and sacking and destroying and, and, you know, and seizing, because that was their task, right? Eventually, the, the thing gets mild and down a little bit, and they, they start getting, you know, more civil in their ways. Think about, I don't know, the systems of, of magistracies that existed in Gaul, pre-Roman Gaul, um, the, you know, even as we've seen the level of uh, development of their, their, their opida, um, their trade, their interests also in the Mediterranean civilizations, um, etc., that probably made them lose part also of the military cohesion, which is true if you look at that point, not much just at the comparison with the Germans that were, they were actually to, to invade, they actually invaded Gaul um, without much of an opposition, but also within the same Celts, right? P populations like the Belgians or the Albatsi, they were uh, renowningly more nationally cohesive than peoples like the Arverni or the Edwe, for example. They were great peoples, they were wealthy, they, they were um, they they managed a lot of uh, of goods. They had a solid administration. They were agri agricultural peoples, but they were weaker, right? And they had even to call for the Romans to to get um, you know to get saved by the the, the invaders. So, um, but at the beginning, in this multi secular overview we make today, it, it was effectively yeah there was an heroic society with the limits that we have seen before, right? These were never like the hero that, like in the stories in their legions and their myths, went there and solved the whole thing just in a single duel, right? The, in, in the historical reality of these peoples, the, the masses were important, right? The tribe as such, the retinues, uh, just also as a more professional, proto-professional, semi-professional, say, uh, units, were fundamental, right? Um, and this gap also will increase, right? If you've seen in pre-Roman times, essentially a large part of the Celtic freemen were now agriculturists. They were maybe, you know, more used to a certain lifestyle in the in, in the wilderness that was, you know, more, you know, they knew what raiding warfare was about, right? But they weren't great um, fighters. If anything, from, from an individual point of view, yes, they, they knew how to handle a spear, a bow, etc., but... Uh, they, they were still technically militias when they were levied. What you see is that by that point, there was a sort of market of war that had um, that had somewhat always existed, but that had, was reinforced. In which you see, you know, entire units of pretty tough, battle-hardened veterans that with pretty damn good skills and equipment that sold their services at the best um, kings. Uh, to the best kings and making a living in that regard. Some of these units were some of the toughest, in fact, the Romans ever met um, in their wars of expansion. Um, but at the same time, and that's what I would like to stress today, that level, of, yeah, there was a lack of concrete political cohesion, right? The Gallic Wars are dramatically, you know, I speak for themselves, but it, this is even more so for, uh, you know, those peoples, that, that those Celtic populations that had remained even more behind that. I mean, look at Britain, right? The, the British Celts were in absolute terms the ones with the lowest military average of the whole Celtic world. Um, so the point I'm making is that, yeah, you have to understand the uh, strong uh, heroic ethos in, in Celtic society um, uh, that ideally favored single combat that also... Uh, so the continuity of certain fighting styles, for example, chariot warfare, right? That most Celts themselves, had, you know, had abandoned some way from the practical use. But those were, I mean, w w chariot warfare was something that remained in the most depressed areas of the, 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 the that world. Like it remained uh, in the Sahara populations of North Africa and Northern Europe. That's what it was. Already Central Europe uh, during the Celtic period had largely abandoned that as a functional thing, or at least had already improved it in a more, you know, towards the heavier model that had somewhat, you know, exceptionally survived in certain Hellenistic contexts, but, you know, in a very different way from, from, from the origin. But we'll see it, uh, it in the end. But these tribal uh, societies naturally uh, were characterized by this spirit of um, would make them fundamentally... Um, in 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 this heroic mindset, I mean, even at at a lower level, right? You know, th this idea of, of even champions advancing from the ranks to challenge the enemy and to fight. You have always to think it was with other people, 
around them, right? And we're talking about Celtic armies in this context. You have to think literally of hundreds, sometimes, of bands, uh, even of maybe just 10 or 20 men, right? They were reunited for the occasion of a large battle, right? So um, the idea is that uh, how they were deployed and organized was something that largely depended um, on factors like that, for example, had nothing to do with geography. There were a lot of people who think that, I don't know, the close order was more typical of the flatland uh, Celts, while the, the mountain ones fought in a certain open, uh, you know, semi-close um, rank. It's, th these are amenities devoid of any foundation. It's way more correct to say that we had had more time to deploy, we had the most cohesive leaders, um, the most solid men, either because they were uh, well-rested, uh, fed, or loyal to the chief, could deploy in a in a closed array. The others literally has you know randomly it, it, it could randomly happen, right? Finding an order in in these armies is is, is very it, it's not so difficult. Like the the stereotype of the Celts attacking like uh, uh, with other barbarians actually in open formations without any any order right this this is a myth because actually all these populations actually fought in and somewhat close our array and they they naturally maintained things like unity of command cohesion mass right that those are the principles of warfare they existed since you know the, the bronze the bronze age consistently as infantries etc so never make the mistake of considering the Celts as absolutely devoid of discipline but you have to look at their politics and their society in realizing that if there is no unity under that point of view you also have are going to have uh, less powerful uh, armies because they're less cohesive right and that's why the Belgians uh, or the the Alvetsi were the toughest right but even them given their political and social structures ended up destroyed by the Romans right so that's that's very important and and we have to to say in absolute terms and when we look at th this is another thing that is very difficult to make people understand in general because of that fanboyism that we were talking about before is that when we look at the central european populations and that this tri the tribal world in general and we think that these guys were somewhat tougher Right, and that's what makes the difference. Well, at, at an individual level, it is true, right? It, it's surely true that the average um, warrior, uh, the, the value of the individuals, was was pretty damn high, uh, considering uh, other people's standards. But uh, w when we're talking about uh, the the complex of military quality of a, of a formation, that's really another thing, and I'm sorry to say that, but this bar barbarian population had a, they were scarce, they were poor in terms of military performance. There, there is no other way to put it. It's simply a matter of organization. Um, so this doesn't mean either, and that's another thing that we must uh, understand, that you can't be defeated by them. You know, what about the Zulus in, you know, against 19th century Brits, right? That's a pretty good example of how that can happen still, and that has nothing to do with, you know, you will, they, I mean, that people will always win. There are a lot of people reason this, this, like this, like, I don't know, an army of Romans had to destroy unavoidably these peoples. No, actually not. And it didn't happen, you know. Many times the Romans suffered uh, striking defeats against peoples like the, the, the Celts um, or the Germans. This has nothing to do with the average military quality of these people that was, yes, structurally lower than the one of the Mediterranean civilization. So there is nothing to do with that, right? This is another passage that if you don't get, we're going to have a problem because th basically there's no other pattern of historical interpretation in that. Um, and th many people take this as a legitimate offense, right? How dare you? These were my ancestors. Well, I'm pretty sure they're my ancestors too, but I still don't give a damn when I have to assess, in fact, what, what they really were. That's a way of respecting them. Right of of portraying them from an historically correct point of view, right? And if you just think that since these were your ancestors, you have to idolize them, well, doesn't make much sense.
right? Also because, you know, it, many people ignore, if, you know, what a, a genetic section of them but it actually is. That is a stratification of basically an, Im an immense amount of different populations and neither, neither, you know, most people don't think maybe they even exist <laughs> at some point. But that's what we are. So he, this is not a race saying uh, the Romans were better, the Celts sucked. No, right? But uh, there is a truth that even if we can't get to precisely because we're we're messed up cognitively speaking, uh, we we at least can approach. And in, in historical terms, uh, yeah, we all the hint the information we have hints heavily at that direction. That's how we we realize it and no this is nothing to do with what the rome how the romans were biased right this is a massive macroscopical uh evidence of of, of many types that tells us that so once again don't ca take it personal so it is right and i'm kind of embarrassed to to be saying these things now but you know i know I know that certain things happen, unfortunately, and that, that certain uh, beliefs are held. And yeah, it's shocking, but it must be reiterated because many people may actually not know about this. So uh, this will tribal heroic character would effectively work for the Celts by giving them this, you know, frenzy character in battle, leaping about. Uh, proclaiming their own heroic deeds and, and their warrior ancestry. Like, we, we know tribal peoples also in other contexts, and, and that's how they behave. It's their vision of the world against yours. This, this idea of proclaiming their their identity, their their ancestry, in order to call uh, upon them this, um, in fact, uh, superhuman strength they're deriving from, from the deity, from those who have somewhat won, uh, of their lineage, they, their that that the military glory, right? And this this is very fascinating because it's a kind of double concept, right? That focuses in part on the individual, but also on its lineage and in in this sort of um, cohesion that is the one that th the guy is uh, showing towards their his clan with whom he's fighting with, right? Um, this ties between. Um, that their that their relatives, but also towards their chieftains, toward to, to whom they swore that their oaths of fealty in with with a deep conviction. With, because they were sacral bonds, as a matter of fact, were everything for these people. That their whole society rested largely on this, because in the absence of a more centralized, sadal structure, nobody could motivate them, discipline them, but uh, themselves in this regard. Right? It was not enough. But still, this higher, um, you know, this individual uh, moral, uh, this bravery, this fanatic courage, etc., was uh, the compensation for that lack of collective discipline that other more developed peoples had known how to give to, to themselves, right? And you could imagine them in front of the lines waving their weapons and clashing them against their shields. Um, quote, howling and singing as their custom was shaking their shields above their heads and brandishing their spears, right? It was a, battles were a multisensorial experience, right? It was really uh, the idea that within certain sounds, within certain names, spells, even in their tattoos, in their symbols, uh, in their banners, uh, the, the the, the the divine power effectively rested, right? It was partly apotropaic, but uh, in other ways was also really calling, um, as we've seen on themselves, a supernatural power that they would that would guide them in this um, um, furious attack against uh, enemy lines, in which they they usually concentrated most of their tactical effectiveness, right? That's another point that we have to explain because simply. These guys don't don't have effective logistical systems. So, what's the point? They can't keep the the field for a shorter time. Uh, they they get easily uh, you know weakened by the you know the weather and uh, other environmental situations. So they have to concentrate most of their uh, tactical resources in in this uh, mass charges that have that essentially maximize their effect as they're still 
um, you know, energetic and motivated and inspired, and that is either you break with that charge or otherwise it's done. Like because all the resources were concentrated in that single shot, and that's where also the stereotypic but somewhat fair uh, depiction of the idea of the uh, I don't know Caesarian legionnaire just stood firm and silent and. Um, orderly in front of these guys that you know shouted and cried and you know eventually ran this uh, with, with all their 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 strength. You know even if even there actually the the, the thing was much more movemented than we can think. The same Romans actually never forgot part of that that same individualism that in fact they they appreci they somewhat appreciated in these populations. I mean the, the Romans admired those peoples who fought uh, for their freedom, right, Wh which really uh, shows this sharing of values that was at the core of this tribal societies um, uh, at their origin in, in the ancient world, right, and, and, and the Romans so in fact did these peoples as somewhat more interesting also in many ways to, uh, to analyze. I mean the Romans had a real interest towards the Central European populations they would demonstrate in their historiography. Um, so, um, the mm, also there was this collective encouragement, right, uh, um, and daunting of the enemy that had to, that was also based on, in fact, a mystics, right, a sort of effect of elaboration that involved sound, look, right, and, and this uh, fearsome aspect that the the other populations were were effectively impressed by, right? Um, this there are other customs that are very interesting and connected to their religious views. For example, a a, a Celt who killed an enemy, especially in a duel, would sever his head as a trophy, tying it to his horse as his harness, or sticking it on his spear. Right. Eventually, the heads were taken home preserved in cedar oil, sometimes displayed on the gates of uh, of the towns. Um, and this um, practice was actually done uh, partly to, it was very common, right, because they thought essentially that the spirit of, of, of the dead lived, or at least some of these characteristics remained in, 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 in the head. Right, so they both decapitated ballad uh, enemies that they, I mean, other champions or kings, right? This is a common practice even in populations of the steppes among the Germans, right? Even the, the famous thing of drinking from the skull. I mean, it's getting this force from from the very spring of the greatness of these people. Remember that uh, among these populations, yeah, there was the idea that, that the warrior, especially the young one, would, had to be um, uh, fanatically aggressive and disrupt and, and, and violent, etc. But the chieftains, right, they were also older on average, had to be also wise, right, because they had to administer justice to uh, to get that that level of reason that um, is necessary in political rather than military affairs, as war is just a, a political act af after all. So. Uh, you wouldn't decapitate and preserve the head of just anyone, right? It was a sort of compliment, as you know, uh, different from our morality as it can uh, appear, to actually cut someone's head after they were killed, and to treasure it in some way. Another practice was done; uh, it was done equally. Was for those given that the Celts roamed uh, pretty extensively, uh, great parts of Europe and and beyond, um, as we have seen. Another practice was for those um, war Celtic warriors that died um, far from home, right? Uh, you know, rather than you know they couldn't bring their their whole body, so they basically severed their head, and they would bring it home. So that was also another way to 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 respect the uh, you know the the memory of the, the the spirit of of the dead in that regard. Considered that Celtic culture in this sense was very as old military uh, societies in this regard was very, very tied to to the afterlife, to the fact that uh, it was somewhat natural for a free, able-bodied male to be a warrior and therefore to, you know, risk to die. You know, life was pretty miserable at the time, in spite of even just war. Um, uh, you know, and uh, and therefore the de the world of the dead was somewhat very, very close, and the relation with the dead as well. This was a bit common in 
many other societies. Um, and it would remain actually for a longer time than we often realize. Um, but even from the the tombs of the dead, this pile, these mounds, would essentially emerge a certain form of cult, right? It seems great part of the Gaelic um, deities um, in um, in Ireland, in fact, would emerge progressively from this uh, tombs, right, of, of fallen chieftains, dead chieftains, or simply, uh, that were in that sense venerated because it was in their uh, earthly greatness they had probably left in uh, in their essence in their um in their tomb that that sort of um that sort of divine power that was what only you know uh, the the only responsible for the earthly glory right the glory didn't belong to these people individually. I mean, of course they had earned it, but it derived from the gods, the god of wars especially. So um, the idea is that they still these individuals had, as mortals, had shared part of that greatness, and therefore these um, tombs would become sort of uh, places of cult, right? And um, believing naturally also that the, the buried dead um, somewhat survived in the in the underground, so the, the the world of the dead being literally that close, right, in, in the tomb itself. So this is very this is very romantic and poetic um, uh, in many ways, and it, once again, it's it's a common practice in many other tribal populations, and this is somewhat typical, especially of the heroic phase, right? It later on in this solidly stratified societies like the Gallic one, um, there was also a sort of, I, would, I wouldn't say feudal world, right? It's an exaggeration to stress the comparison with the medieval time, but I mean, the idea that, you know, it was a powerful aristocracy in that the majority of freemen actually wasn't d completely free anymore. They actually worked for them as agriculturists, which was sort of infamous uh, life style. In fact, Caesar actually ascribes this oversimplifying naturally all the various shades that existed also in this regard, that the, the Celtic world had two classes, right? One of the warriors and one other of the serfs, right? And it, it's often interpreted like, ah, no, because serfdom and slavery wasn't so widespread in the Celtic world. Well, I mean, it, technically, yeah, it was in the sense that these were peoples who were not so affluent to have so many slaves like, I don't know, a Roman senator could have his own latifundium, so in that sense it was not widespread, but of course slavery was normal And uh, but I here what we care about is that the same freemen in, in a way had become uh, at least clients of, of someone more powerful that at that point was the one who had the pride of being the warrior, right? And there was also a hierarchy. This influenced even the battle arrays. I mean, in the front lines, the the, the greatest uh, men of 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 their uh, of their societies had to uh, the, the honor of serving in first line. The others came after, right? There was this fanatic uh, bravery that had to be obstinated in, in every situation, albeit even in their the reality is somewhat less uh, ideal. Um, th there is a sort of process of secularization, right, to, to stress maybe excessively the, the concept, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, even the concept of, as we will see, Celtic cavalry that was objectively important, especially among the Gauls, is somewhat, not that, you know, there was so much pride in, tri in the tribal world to fight on horseback. I mean, it was a matter of status or prestige, but the ideal, just like with the chariot, was that, you know, the... The, the 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 champion the nobleman would actually dismount to fight on foot so also in there we don't have to be the, our view doesn't have to be distorted by you know the ideal that definitely existed in these cultures but also the practice of warfare is somewhat different because technically who fought on horseback could was potentially a coward because could flee away from the battlefield instead these people had to fight to death right and 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 this is and and you can't even hear. I can't stress enough how important this was. Um, and as th these clientels, as we've seen, were actually kept together with this bond of, of you know of loyalty, of fanatic loyalty. Like I, every warrior had the duty to die in battle before his chieftain, right? And the chieftain himself couldn't say, oh, I'm simply the rich guy. I can do whatever I want. I even can flee from the field. I will remain rich." I mean, someone would have done that. 
but I mean, your figure were discredited forever because you had basically, you were the leader, right? You were not just the military commander, but you were also the civil ruler of your community. If you fled from battle, you were worthless as an individual. I mean, you were literally scum. So there was an enormous pressure that the same society had learned to, to put on their leaders, right? And they were rightfully elite in this regard because they had the means to do their, their duty, right? And and this is something that is noticed uh, naturally by, by the Romans, who, by those who fought against them, uh, right? Um, and, yeah, so as we've seen, often chariot warriors would be driven into battle but fight afoot, right? And this was also connected definitely with the cult of the duel, right? Think about Homer's chariot ho heroes who also fight dismounted. Uh, uh, are a close parallel. That that there is also technical reasons for that. The reason for that that, um, especially in the archaic period, in the heroic period, if if, if, if ideally speaking, uh, panoplies were much heavier. I mean, have you ever seen what a Bronze Age warrior was loaded with, right? Um, and obviously, the, in order to reach the battlefield, I mean, a chariot was definitely more comfortable even just than a horse that still requires a lot of physical uh, strain to ride, um, especially with all that armor on, right? So that's where the thing ideally stemmed from. This thing, uh, th this kind of um, warrior of this heroic had a survived chiefly in Britain. That's what we were saying before, and that's what was paradoxical on the thing that, I mean paradoxical to maybe is a new to this concept but that you know it's exactly where there is more heroic warfare going on that there is the lowest military quality right because if you have to resort on the single guy you would theoretically has to fight simple in duels well, something tells us that your society is not well uh you know predisposed to war on, on the scale that was was going on at the time on the massive scale was going on at the time was dramatically more organized, you know, logistically, you know, in terms of discipline, of formations, tactics, collective discipline, I mean, all things that this society couldn't have, because they didn't have the structures to develop, right? Um, there is also this very interesting um, concept, the Trimarchisia, right, that described by Pausanias, which means the, literally the three horses, Right, Pausanias says that basically each Celtic horseman was accompanied by two grooms, um, who, though armed and mounted, would hold behind the lines and not fight. Right, this is very ideal, as well. Right, that their duty was theoretically to carry off their master if he was hurt, bringing him a spare horse if necessary, and if he was killed or wounded, one would replace him in battle, but otherwise they would take no active part. Right. So theoretically, these are the squires of the Celtic world, right? It, and as we we're saying before, actually, even uh, chivalric culture of medieval times owes a lot to these populations, right? We see in Middle Ages as this, mel you know, blinding, uh, you know, depending where where you you come from, probably in the British Isles, there is much sounder uh, awareness of the importance of the Celtic dimension. But it's in continental Europe, so it's mostly about. I mean, I would say that the Latin Germanic side of the story, but indeed, indeed, the Celts were uh, also way more chivalric, you know, uh, sh uh, chivalrous in, in a way than, I don't know, say that the Germans, for example, that initially were so primitive and poor that they had very few horses. But even the same Romans that instead had developed, that actually always maintain a, an enormous care of their cavalry, contrarily wise to what is commonly believed. J j they just had a few, but it, the, the few they had was very, very good. Um, and but they, you know, now were a society that produced large amounts of people who fight well on foot, right? And de therefore democratized you know, be, with a lot of brackets because Roman society was still, ma you know, radically oligarchic in nature. Uh, but, however, the masses of, of, of the fighting men, and the same Celts, after all, were were not, uh, you know, uh, horse-riding peoples, right? They were the, the, the wide majority of their warriors were, were infantrymen. They couldn't afford a horse, nor, you know, the full panoply that was a very costly business, right? But this idea of the Trimarchisia obviously reflects 
uh, clearly what we think as the knight with the two attendants, like with the spare horses that had to bring, you know, uh, drinks uh, between a charge and another, you know, uh, substitute broken uh, spears and so on. And this is very fascinating because uh, it shows how um, aristocratic minded a uh, great part of Celtic society actually was, right? And this reflects already something that is very far from the archaic, heroic, uh, tribal model. It's already something more advanced than that. It's already something that is transitioning towards a more complex society, uh, a more stratified one. Um, but also let's not uh, underestimate in general at the root of all these populations, as we've seen before, the, the deep, um, you know, the, the memory that they have retained from the Caucasian step naturally of the fact, even in their deities, etc. That I mean this deities of of war uh coming on this terrible inferic war horses to, you know, deliver the, the their wrath on, 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 on the enemy on the battlefield. What were things that these people lived deeply in, right? Even think about drugs um, uh, psychedelics, uh, etc. These were making all one with with war, with um, human sacrifices. Um, I mean, these people were leaving those uh, somewhat supernatural experiences through this um, this lifestyle, right? That that was necessary. It was a way to really leave the world to see the world, but very far from also. There, there is also another group of people that I recently discovered that associate the psychedelic like to a more ideal of pacific world where everybody expands their mind in a loving sense that you know make us surpass our petty differences. No, these people use them literally to butcher each other and rip them in half, right? Because that was their world and it worked like that and it was functional to that. I'm sorry, I don't buy culturalist interpretations, right? Uh, humans are aggressive in, the, in their own in their own nature. They're violent, right? They can be lo loving and good and, and, and fair, but they can be even, you know, bloody uh, murderers at, at their worst. And what I would like to make understanding here is that, albeit not com not commending violence as a general response to problems, but the fact that these societies here worked with violence because it was objectively the only resort, right? If you have to fight for uh, for the land that you don't have because there is space just for one there, you, you have to kill the other guy. I mean, it's, it's not something you would morally justify today, but at the time, it was either you or, or him. And that's what all this warrior ethics stemmed from, right? And, uh, and it was pretty damn violent. I mean, uh, it was really very violent. I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, this also is often attributed to the idea of the of the Greeks and the Romans who wanted to depict the... Uh, the Celts as monsters, as uh, evil, but these societies were really, really cruel, really, really fierce and violent, and uh, there was a logic in it, there was a justice in it, there was a justice too, yes, there was, there was a way, it was a way to balance the societies, I don't know a society that self-destructs itself, uh, you know, anthropologically speaking, uh, things are done to preserve a certain sense of, you know, of, of community, of common, of morale, right, and yeah, human sacrifices, not not just, uh, by the way, of enemies, of captured prisoners, like of, of war, um, but even people who willingly sacrifice their life to the deity. We, we, we simply are too far from those words to understand what, what these people would spiritually feel in order to, to, to do such a thing, but it was actually pretty common, and it was part of simply of a different vision of the world. I mean, think that these people didn't know they weren't. They didn't have a scientific revolution, a rationalism of of a developed. Value. These people lived in a world that was in largely incomprehensible without these great, um, you know, uh, uh, m mysticization. I would say um, of 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 reality, and they and they lived within it. Like they they thought that. Uh, the, the goals especially are very fascinating in this because you can see in them that this process of very s uh, slow, as we've seen, rationalization, secularization that came up the role. There was a time of the gods one day, right? Then eventually of the heroes, now of the men. It's how it was this passage. For many people that had remained behind still at the idea of, of the time of the heroes or even of the gods in some measure, 
and there was no solution of discontinuity in here uh, for some even and these people live the legends of, of mixed with wisdom and naturalistic notions think about the druids and the, the astonishing amount of, of knowledge actually they 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 treasured and passed down to to the various uh, to the other generation of of, of priests um so yeah it's a very fascinating world in this regard and and war was definitely a part of it i mean the same druids were i mean sometimes we see we think about asterix think about the druids were just you know uh elderly guys with a very long beard and you know a bit uh tiny and and uh you know just picking herbs and stuff no the, the word druids were actually warriors and they were pretty <laughs> you know beastly mother f uh you know what <laughs> and um and that because effectively no, the knowledge about warfare was intertwined with all the one of the, the, the universal understanding right and there was truly an idea that through um this magic understanding of of reality of, of the, the the religious dimension i mean certain occult forces could come into you during during the fight and to render you more and these people exalted themselves and used means that would make them effectively believe in it. And it functioned well for them, right? Think about the so-called fanatics. There's where people really took drugs. And, uh, I mean, even if this, let's see, it would be debatable in... in I mean, we, sh we should understand better what, what that meant. But um, there was this idea of, of the f what would stereotypically be attributed to the Germans eventually, I mean the Furor, uh, from what the Romans talked about. Well, this thing was, was already there. Technically, also the Romans had something like that by themselves. And it's that individualistic, uh, military um, uh, fury that was necessary to overcome fear and, uh, and, and, and simply do what you had to do because it was either that shot or otherwise you would have died in a worse way, so it was better to die like that, and and even maybe achieving some actual results through that, um, you know, that frenetic uh, attitude behavior than than being uh, enslaved, for example, which most Celts actually would, especially in the early days, would simply uh, avoid by committing suicide and taking with them their their women, their children. Uh, because the idea of being unfree was such an humiliation, was such a loss of of the uh, gods' uh, favor that it was better to die, right? To remain true to your to your beliefs, to your to your code of of honor, to your uh, because they believed, in fact, naturally that there was another life beyond this one, and and they would uh, enter in that. Uh, in the best possible way under that regard and you're saying it's it, it's very military dominated as an ideal right that there is there is no it's something that commits the whole society that is especially when these tribes put themselves on the march where uh we know it i mean they were committed to to fight to the death like it was sometimes a, a matter of annihilation Right, it's either you or me. Like, even if you had to settle in another territory where other people lived, well, you had to fight with them. I mean, it was dramatic, really, really dramatic. But it's how it worked. And this was the only way, effectively, to cope with it. Regarding the Tre Marchesia here, we also have to stress that probably Pausanias was, was somewhat wrong about the uh, fact of the two grooms remaining actually armed, but behind... Uh, you know, uh, as, uh, away from from combat because uh, you know you would waste two thirds of your army's horsemen for doing that. Right? It doesn't make a lot of sense. But still, the ideal was yeah that the champion had to go out there and challenge the his uh, equal uh, in a duel. And yeah, but evidently in reality it wasn't like that. And it it adds, however, the the implicit information that effectively there was a segmentation in Celtic cavalry that was articulated in different levels and not just organically but also in terms of tactical specialization. I mean it's obvious that the the knight here would be heavier than the two grooms and that these would perform maybe other tactical roles that were preparatory to battle, skirmishing, also pursuing the enemy, um, etc.
And um, so, but we have to see, even if, you know, the idea of the duel is somewhat, uh, you know, I- idealized, we don't have to think me of a Celtic battle as so largely different from that in the sense that probably along the battle line, there were so there's so many different bands led by the, the champion, by the chieftain, right, that would simply, you know, attack uh, one after the other, maybe alternatively, or maybe all en masse, right, and, and still, you know, being about that individual heavier guy that had to break through and the, the others following uh, the gap, if he was. So, uh, the whole thing, while the, the rest of the line would go on capering and chanting and uh, think about the blaring of this many war horns and, and trumpets, the famous Karnex, right, these were also all religious things. If you look at the Karnex and this... Uh, essentially animal-shaped uh, trumpet, I don't know how to call it, horn, actually, um, that uh, emitted this sounds. I mean, some replicas are some of the most fascinating and beautiful things I've ever heard, like these wound sounds that really touch your inter- inner spiritual co- chords in many ways. I mean, they, you understand with what the, the, the wall symbol that thing was, it was, in, at that point, uh, the animal itself represented on the carnex speaking, Right, um, uh, or better, the divinity speaking through that animal on the battlefield. So th- those were words of encouragement of, you know, in a language that only the spirituality of those times, now lost unfortunately, could have made us, you know, um, uh, understand. And that to these people had to to mean the world, right? Because that was the the sacred animal to their to their deity from which they you know they had prayed I don't know for for their children to uh, to be born or to to survive during an illness or that for their fields to uh, to be prosperous right and and everything depended on them they were their standards they were the symbol of their identity of their pride of their honor right and that's what fueled their 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 strength during fights there were some of the most violent things you can't ever imagine, right? So, um, in, and naturally, this mm, lines would, would also generally charge all together at some point to try to break uh, the enemy. Now, as you know, we don't have to descend in the details, but uh, every battle at the time, these battles could last even an entire day, fights were dramatically close. We're talking about things like 30 seconds, right? Because after that, if you wanted to fight again, you had to, uh, you know, to recover forces and do it again and again. And this, you know, between in between, the guys would spend the time largely skirmishing and provoking each other. But, I mean, if you fight more than, than three or four minutes, you're already exhausted, right? You're not much good for it. Just imagine even the context in which the situation happened. But it was very violent, right? It's nothing like you see in reenactments. Um, these were worlds that, you know, which even the physicality of these people was astonishing, right? Even, I mean, the average Hellenic Oplite that was effectively an amateur of warfare by definition, maybe with the usual exception of the Spartans, had a, a physicality that, and a physical aggressiveness that now, you know, you don't yeah, see a reenactment that they are, you know, something incredibly weak in comparison. You can't imagine what a tribal warrior of Central Europe could be at this point. I mean, it, it was such a physically aggressive business that all what we think, uh, most of what we think, you know, that this tactics, even their fencing, was, was something so radically more dynamic and brutal and violent and fast uh, in ways that we have lost and we'll never recover because simply we're not the people of those times. So we can't reenact what that really was. Fortunately, um, that would be illegal, I, I presume, as well. So, um, but uh, the idea is that, and this was, as always, a clash between moral forces, like the less enthusiastic side would uh, collapse um, in pretty short order at some point, a result of battle thus being largely decided by the duels, maybe, of some of the toughest guys. Um, so that's the, the point of, of the thing. 
and other psychological preparations, right? This chance, etc. It's not just a slogan that you know you do because you think it. Otherwise, your your you know your deity would simply be angry, right? The, that's maybe the first reason for you to explain. But the, the point is that this chance and things were about really fueling the morale of your army. Uh, in um, with a rhythm, you know, with a synchronism that even in there we, we can't fully understand, but was all one with these waves of attack, um, uh, uh, you know, to fight that certain amount of time, then retreating and doing it, doing it again. So it, it's in this case that maybe yeah, the best armored troops in the front had this kind of leading role, and that's what the, the reminiscence of of the, the heroic warfare was about, right? And this can be observed also in other situations where the, f you know, the first ranks are normally heavier, right? Um, and it's really uh, an important uh, way of, of, of framing this this fights. Um, so naturally, this was uh, a procedure that fared pretty well when fighting against other Celts or other, you know tribal societies that would observe some convention, right? This war was, you know, the, the idea is that um, heroic warfare goes along with a certain level of ritualization, but warfare, as we know, largely goes beyond that. Um, the Celtic societies become, you know, more dynamic, as we've seen, as they, they can become more structural, so warfare becomes, you know, something on a larger scale, less uh, pious in many ways, more destructive and, uh, you know, also costly for the same, uh, even for the same winners, right, with uh, also important political and social changes going along with that. But naturally, as we've seen, this is the period in which the Celts meet other foes, um, that are also undergoing their own transformations. For example, there are instances, pretty famous, in which actually there were Celtic champions that would meet with Roman champions, right? As we have seen, the Romans were actually not that different, and they also won, actually, against uh, the Celts, this individual combats, to say also what Roman uh, society of, I don't know, the 4th century actually, uh, 5th or 4th century actually was in that regard with a still largely aristocratic, sacral, in fact heroic um, structure was very similar to the tribal one um, and so yeah, the, there is uh, even in here all an idealization that came through historiography but is talking to us about things that that actually happened right in similar ways uh, indeed um, and the the idea is, however, also in these circumstances, surely there were other people involved in the fight. Um, where um, there were more organized hosts, right? You see, going on, think about the Battle of Centinum, the Battle of Telamon, right? All you know, massive uh, Celtic hosts that would engage in large-scale battles with enemies like the Romans. Um, the preferred tactic, as we have seen before, was this ferocious mass charge, right? Generally accompanied by the usual leaping and screaming to work up their own courage and daunt the enemy. There's this other beautiful quote referred to the, uh, the Celts uh, at the Battle of the Thermopylae, Right in the third century BC, when the uh, the Galatians invaded uh, Greece, um, which says they rushed at their adversaries like wild beasts, full of rage and temperament, with no kind of training at all. A bit stereotypical, but not enormously distant from reality. The blind fury never left them while there was a uh, breath in their bodies. Uh, even with arrows and javelins sticking through them, they were carried on by sheer spirit while their life lasted. Now, this is very fascinating. This is uh, the attack on the Thermopylae, as we have seen, which you see the Celts going almost berserk, right? And it's literally the same thing, like what we see in the berserkers and later in Germanic culture is exactly 
the same thing was shared by the Celts, by the Romans initially in, in their tribal stage. Um, there's no way, there's literally no difference. Like it, it exists in every single tribal society, wherever you go, Asia, North America. It, yeah, the the berserk thing is is literally the same. Um, and and however, in here, the Celts didn't make uh, an headway. Um, and uh, until their leaders called them off, right? And in this description, you see the brutality of this combat and this observation that must have not been far from the truth that these guys would keep on fighting even when they had literally arrows and javelins, you know, stuck in them, right? We even know that uh, some actually took their javelins, to, you know, I think it was another occasion, and, and they threw them um, to the enemy <laughs> in turn, right? Uh, so that's pretty rough, but it, it also makes you understand really the physicality of that world. I mean, the, the meat grinder out of which these populations had come from Central Europe. I mean, people that are used to say, okay, I will get this arrow piercing my arm and then I will pull it out and, um, and I, you know, I will suffer. But you have to imagine these guys as, you know, a regular, you know, as regular you know, regular military lifestyle, be, being covered in scars, like to be horrendously deterred by all the horrendous wounds that they, you know, at least those who were lucky to uh, to survive to, which also explains why some of them, as we will see, fought naked, because actually, uh, you know, if you have cloth on on your wound, it's 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 difficult to pull out the, the all the various fragments of tissue that can infect more easily the wound. So th there were some practical reasons behind that as well, but I mean it's surely the, the idea that that even the the level of of of, of pain that these individuals could sustain was actually much um, uh, higher than ours, right? And it's not because we are different. Technically, we're the same identical people. It's just that the lifestyle we lead today doesn't make us used to it. But if we were to live actually in the way they did. If you were lucky to survive in that context, you would probably adapt, even at the levels of you know your soil of, of pain and uh, and fatigue, right? Because the body, the human organism, does adapt to to these things in, in a way. And um, the and and one weakness in this um, specific episode that can serve as an example is that you know. If you really put everything in terms of strength, moral, physical resources in, in this massive charge, you do not break through the enemy. Well, that's where you're pretty, you know, you're you're, you're done for in some ways. In fact, there were sources in the ancient world said goals in general were the most formidable and spirited in their first assault, while still fresh. So it's this direct, like, okay, there's no need to waste time being. Uh, soften up and and disordered by enemy fire. Let, let's attack only one shot. If we make it, it's fine. And why not? And naturally, this requires a certain, uh, also mental and physical predisposition to it, which means you have to throw yourself it, it, over the enemy uh, blades, literally. Um, and yet, that may be your only chance of doing that, right? Consider what it means also in in this context to. I mean, think about the, the average uh, Roman legionnaire that fought in Gaul at the time. It was regularly armored, you know, in metal and, you know, with, with pretty effective weapons. Well, the average Celtic warrior would be an average tribesman, let's suppose, that would spend most of his life plugging the, the land and having, uh, you know, a shield and, and a spear or two or three, right? And that's it. Maybe not having even a any type of armor whatsoever. So think of what it means even from that point of view to, I mean, to go against a person who is covered in iron um, and, you know, that is drilled and trained. I mean, you, you must have hell of guts to do that because you will be chopped down uh, pretty easily, pretty quickly, by the way. So, but the this idea of the mass that has to attack and that in, in this mass there is all the ethos of the tribe and that you know the, the the various individuals are sacrificable right because there were even uh 
su uh, suicidal rites in in the same war bands like the, the was at least is what the Romans say that certain Celtic war band we've seen it in that video we made about the Gaelic warrior with the Fianas right is that this idea that, that there were certain war bands of mercenaries that were devotees to their chieftain to their to the divinity of of their band that that while entering their life basically their life didn't belong to them anymore and for for that reason it was normal to keep up the the spirit and the uh paradoxically and the the level of commitment to that lifestyle it was horrendously brutal they would kill every once in a while someone say the last one who attended the the war band meeting on a regular base just to say while you enter here your life does not belong to you anymore because you're just a devotee of the deity and that's what you are and that's what after all um, military discipline is uh, I mean that's how they um, you know in absence of more of larger uh, of a larger military organization they they tried in fact to 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 compensate it with with this higher moral commitment right you don't you can't perform complicated maneuvers tactics etc uh like other professionally drilled uh units of other civilizations can so at least we will overload you with this uh, radical craziness and obsession about the fact that you will throw yourself against the enemy no matter what and that will do for compensated right and and consider that in the ancient world in this regard the asymmetry between a Roman army and a Celtic army was was relatively low. That is, yeah, okay, the Romans, especially in Gaul, that won with relative ease. But we know that in fact that, that there wasn't that enormous difference, uh, even in actual sheer strength. That much was compensated by that moral uh, resource, right? So. Uh, it's like in our military today like you don't have to reason with your mind when you're you're given an order like you have to do it in, in just in how to perform it but not questioning the order in itself well these guys brought it that far to say okay your life doesn't even belong anymore we will kill you for a trivial reason just to show you know uh, the rest of, of the people we're not kidding here in the unit and and don't think that we're we're actually abandoned that from quite quite a long time because up up to a, a few generations ago telling the truth i mean uh, violence uh, camaraderie in the sense of you know putting people under very tough strains was the norm right um it you look at many militaries in the world i mean this is still going on technically speaking that the weakest especially is brought down and annihilated because that's what the group wants and and the whole thing here is is the group because it's the group that saves your your life out there but in exchange for that given that this is also divinely uh, driven um your life depends on them depends on the group not on yourself so this is brutal but believe me it does work i mean it does work in a tribal society naturally in, in a modern civilization you know highly sophisticated uh, strategic culture and uh, technology and um uh, and, and drill and discipline you don't need that uh, fortunately but still you know in, in a in a society yeah these things happen and they happen at many other levels that we some what are not aware of it's like a bit with kids i mean kids are pretty damn nasty right and you know it because either you were bullied or you were a bully um you know how evil you can be in a group sometimes and and the ultimate goal you see there that in spite of the losses and the uh, the injustice of the thing that there is a sort of collective morale that gets boosted through that so that those who are too weak tend to in fact to succumb and to to have pretty serious problems unfortunately but the others you know develop the thick skin that maybe in their lives even it turns out to be useful which is ugly to say but if you look at the the thing in historical perspective it's it's how societies largely work now i, I don't know what it's the best thing i don't know I'm, i but you know th this thing is somewhat natural in some ways maybe it has a reason right which is not justifiable commendable but at least you we should understand it to see also how okay we get rid of it but how do we compensate for it which is an interesting very fascinating question um but the idea is that you will fight to the dead 
right? And that especially you were under the guide of this charismatic chieftain to which you had sworn this oath of allegiance and that you had promised essentially to fight for their life uh, to the death and, al and also, right, that you had to emulate because it was a shame for these soldiers, not just, I mean, to these warriors, let's say better, to... Uh, not only to die before their chieftain, but also to do something to do less than what the chieftain had done in battle, um, in combat, um, and and that you would pay for in that regard, because if if you had underperformed, chances are that you were the ones who got under and could even be killed or become an outcast. Consider that aside from these uh, bands of 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 devotees that was also in the let's say in the civil you know in the village let's assume it in this way in the zip uh, um, the uh, I mean the idea that if you for example if you fled the battlefield I mean you you were dead for your family so you this is typically said for the Germans but the Celts had the same exact thing uh, I mean your wife wouldn't I mean you would basically be ignored and your only option was to hang yourself this to say, even the non-military world of the band, uh, you know, um, detached from civil society that went around like bands of wolves devoted to the uh, semi-nomadic deities of war, to, to, to rape and slaughter, etc., the, the civil world of the village would still have in, in, imbued this very strong sense of, of community for which if your uh, you know your 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 husband your your son your 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 father behaved like a coward in battle uh that person didn't exist anymore because he didn't deserve to exist as a human being just think of what it means i mean it's it's terrifying but that was the the way those people lived like the same goes for the collective suicide as we have seen before i mean uh th there are these beautiful uh, st uh, the beautiful statue of the dying Galatian that, in my opinion, is one of, of the greatest peaks of Western civilization in terms of artistical artwork, in which uh, this uh, Hellenistic statue that depicts the famous, chiefly for the Roman copies, etc., that depicts the... There are two, actually. One of the, the, the Galatian dying because he has killed himself and the, uh, the Galatian having already killed this woman and he is about to, you know, to put his, uh, his sword into his own uh, chest and the beauty of the art there is sublime but at the same time what what, what is the real masterpiece um, is, is the is, is the expression I mean this idea this this pride this honor I've put this picture also in the I think at the end especially in a, at the end of the video it should be the, the concluding one of the face of this Galatian I mean, you could see it there. He he was done for. He was destroyed. But you also know what his fate was. There is no uh, life in slavery. You have to kill yourself. That was their their moral standard, and uh, this had impressed so much uh, the Greeks and the Romans that considered it as a, you know, uh, as a viable and honorable way to go. Like think uh, things like I don't know. Uh, Antony or I don't know Varus or all people who threw themselves on this war because at that time was the true life of a man right and this is very important yeah, a man that screws up ha must have the courage to kill himself <laughs> you know it's a pretty interesting moral lesson from the ancient world but again contextually speaking was functional to to that world as well and and the it, the uh, the classical sources state that the Celts were made of this. Stereotypically, ideally, okay, but also for real, many times. Um, so, what else can we say here? Um, this was this... Uh, and, and by the way, in this idea of the failure of the major charge stays the, the drama of Celtic warfare in this regard because the the idea w was that they didn't lose their heart proper after that they simply albeit strong because there was all a uh, physicality as we've seen in an athleticism behind such uh, military performances they lacked stamina um, stereotypically right especially the Romans stressed as always that 
you know the barbarians were very had very large bodies were very strong but they couldn't uh, they could deliver this force immediately like uh, uh, major blows at the moment but effectively they they were not resilient enough in the long run and there is this stereotype that I've never shared that basically uh, this became a problem for the Celts when they um, swept uh, into the hotter lands of Italy and Greece, right? Um, because, you know, aside from the fact that if you are already in, in the Mediterranean, you, I mean, from how long are you there? From months? From weeks? I mean, your organism ha has already somewhat adapted. Secondly, what about the I mean, the, the Greeks and the Italics, I mean, are they simply, they can't perform certain things on average because it's the weather that... Mm. Also, because, you see, th this is quoted for the Celts, but, for example, the Romans said that the Germans, uh, uh, and this explains it well, were too, they didn't have enough stamina, and they suffered greatly of heat and cold. So this has nothing to do with the colder weather of the... Mm, continental latitudes right this has to do with a it's you know a source that the stereotypes what has to do largely more with logistics right uh, we are all alike right you we suffer heat and cold in the same exact way if you go into a certain environment the organism will kind of adapt to that in part then there are certain limits that everybody can hold um, so this is nothing to do about the Celts being more used to a freer, cooler weather um, than, you know, than southern Europe, let's say. Because I don't know if you've ever been in summer in places, even like Germany or France. I mean, try to fight in summer, and <laughs> you tell me, you know, if you're not, like, really uh, exhausting yourself, even just by... Uh, so it, it makes literally no sense. The, the concept here is that these guys largely didn't have effective logistical trains, supplies, right? And therefore it was easy to wear them out or with uh, systemically as armies with, you know, the weather, right? It was a very hot or very cold, but the, the concept here is simply that they didn't have enough uh, resources to compensate after the first charge for a longer time because they didn't have enough supplies in this regard so that was the real problem really rather than the the local temperatures that are just one factor out of so many um so but the greater problem was according to the classical orders that the celts often lacked tactical sense right this is also a bit of a stereotype um, the the classical sources said, okay, they, they usually charging one mass. Um, they they are easy to outflank. They usually have no reserves to fall back on, and it will kind of collapse uh, at once. Um, this was a somewhat abstracted um, realization. I suspect more of a Hellenic matrix than Roman one, um, because. You know, as we've seen, the, the Celtic armies were also sometimes pretty tough to counter, right? And uh, there are many battles in which you see that their arrays were somewhat more more complex. Think about the Battle of Telamon, right? And speaking of the back, uh, but there were many others. To today, I wanted to include uh, some, you know, ba the explanation of some battles, but I realized the video would have been too long, so I promise that we will talk naturally in other videos about s single battles, as we do, uh, in which we will see the, the Celtic performance. But, for example, let's take the, some of the most ferocious charges ever that were associated in the Celtic world with the infantry known as the Gaisatai. Now, these were guys who fought uh, naked, who had a great uh, heroic attitude themselves, you know, they were kind of almost beast-like, um, uh, likely uh, portrayed by the classical sources. Their greatest performance is, in fact, the Battle of Telamon. Um, and uh, where, actually, they were worn out by vain charges against skirmisher, right? Which, yeah, it kind of lacks tactical sense if these especially are your best infantry. Um, and the idea, what were the Gaisatai? Why, the, the, the concept is the, the Gaisatai are 
sometimes translated as spear men because of the guys whom that was the this uh, this weapon uh, similar somewhat similar to the Roman pedon right but um the the term has uh, a different etymological root which is connected in Celtic with the idea of the sacred bond of the war bands right so these were the guys had I would be with some approximation this um ultra elite of um uh, young robust men roaming around in the kind of typical indo european predatory fashion uh, and it were so toughened up by this life of, of of warfare essentially that would make them essentially the equivalent of military professionals very often mercenaries employed also by uh, non celtic um powers uh, for sure as you know the celtic mercenaries were widespread all over the mediterranean for a long time you could find them as far as egypt right they were you know sometimes we're also even very close to places like as we've seen in um asia minor they they settle in there you find them in sicily you find them uh even in in africa uh i mean in north uh, among the cartaginians for example the, yeah the, they they had visited spain uh, as well but i mean the, these bands were roaming around uh pretty 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 much and the reason was evidently that these small band the, these bands of um military professionals actually were were, were pretty good because rarely there were so such good mercenaries especially uh, as mm, infantry uh, troops that, uh, as the Celts uh, at that point this point specifically between the 4th the 2nd century BC uh, roughly um so uh, this custom however declined um together with Gallic ferocity right perhaps softened by contact with civilization as we've seen before so the process these guys settled down uh their presence as mercenaries is, is connected in fact with the sedentarization of same celts in um in southern europe and in in in, in asia even so mm, in the east uh, although the galatians still fought naked in 189 bc against rome uh, they did not show the savage, uh, savagery and spirit of their ancestors in the Battle of the Thermopylae, let's say, in 279 BC, as we have seen. But, for example, they held on that occasion a defensive position, waiting passively for the enemy to come to them, instead of attacking, which is fascinating, because, uh, for example, you see in the Gallic Wars, this rarely happened. Think about this ferocious Belgian attacks, even on absolutely disadvantageous disadvantageous grounds that you know if these guys had charged you know, on a flat land it would have been something incredibly tough to to hold in the first place because guess what uh northern europe was still more uh, you know about that heroic mindset than these guys framed in asia minor between some of the most sophisticated hellenistic kingdoms partly had uh, lost um, but even as cohesion, in fact, the Galatians weren't this big deal. Even when they rebelled, they, they were usually, eventually, they were defeated by the. I mean, these Cajuns were defeated by the Romans. Then they became Roman auxiliaries, and even during, if during the Mithridatic War, um, uh, the wars they they rebelled to Rome. They somewhat split. And this doesn't seem to have particularly helped the Pontix, nor to have you know upset the Romans. Uh, as you know, eventually Galatia would be integrated, rendered a province later on in the first century. Um, and there may be uh, some truth, however, in the in in the Roman idea that they had become enervated by the heat and the luxury of Greek culture. Right, this fact that. Um, of course, if you settle in a foreign land that is different, it's going to be a uh, well in our thing, right? It seems that initially the Galatians weren't even particularly good at, you know, finding on the Anatolian mountains. Well, the local populations were skilled mountaineers, right? But there were many mountaineers among the Celts, in, uh, especially around the Alps, you know, in Central Europe that had somewhat adapted to the ground. So, we're, as always, we're talking about a very wide uh, 
range of populations that we call as Celts, but that also share very different traits, also different um, uh, cultural influences from other peoples, uh, etc. Um, and contrary to what is um, commonly thought, uh, Celtic infantry usually fought in very close formations, right? There is, um, in uh, that they usually, uh, at least they often, overlapped shields, right? Uh, there is even one episode in which the Roman pila are recorded as piercing two shields uh, and pinning the, sh the, the wielders together, right? And this also gives us the information that was those were kind of flatter shields, right? Not necessarily concaves, because actually the better way to to make a shield world is with flat shields where you can overlap them. So we think that was the the concept. And the front line, uh, the, the, I mean the front line of these armies were fairly compact, right? There is another topic that now we can't, um, you know, we can't address fully, but we'll see it better when we make a video about the Celtic equipment. Uh, is that um, there is uh, the idea that the Celtic shield uh, is believed in a bit of an apocalyptic way um, a shield for troops in somewhat oper open order for the melee with the sword differently from the oplitic one would have been a shield just useful for troops that are equipped with lanks and, and closed orders and nobody really has ever demonstrated or provided an exhaustive explanation for these that are considered true and proper undebatable assumptions, right? And on, on the contrary, we have troops that actually fight with pikes and oval shields of Celtic of Celtic type and troops that fight with uh, javelins and oblitic shields. That is to say that, um, once again, if you see a guy equipped with an oblon, it that has literally nothing to do with that. That is, a, a, it fights like in an Hellenic phalanx or not leaving aside that the Hellenic phalanx actually didn't replicate outside Greece at all, because we, even the Greek colonies began to fight in completely different ways, because guess what? Military uh, you know, formulas are product of certain specific contexts, right? But it's like with the Romans. Everybody thinks the Romans copied the Greek phalanx. That, that's an asinine mistake. That never happened, historically speaking. The fact that there are uh, guys equipped like Hoplites has literally nothing to do with, with with how these guys fought, tactically speaking. The same goes for the Celts. There were se or even certain Hellenized Celtic troops that fought with Hoplites, right, in southern Gaul. Why not? You know, there were Greeks that were all around the, the Mediterranean coast, and these guys, the, especially the elites, would buy Greek stuff. But, you know, did they fight as phalanxes? Another mistake is often done, and people read Hellenic sources of the time and read phalanx used as, um, you know, to describe um, Celtic or even Roman or Carthaginian infantry. And people think that that means that, that the Greeks were, I mean, that, that these peoples fought like the Greeks in, in the phalanx that has more historiographically speaking come on the fore as a tactical model. Absolutely false. In, in Greek, the term phalanx means is essentially a, you know, uh, a, a unit of heavy infantry of some kind, right? Or, let's say, medium-heavy uh, infantry. That's literally it. That he is, of course, the legion is a phalanx in that regard. Of course, Celtic infantry is a phalanx, right? Uh, and after all, um, the Celts did fight in somewhat close array, as we have seen, um, somewhat on a regular base, or rather, of course, they had their own problems, as we have seen, to to keep formation, especially keeping the unity, but I mean the idea that infantry should be in close array to fight it to be more effective, something that I mean comes from the times of the sea peoples that you know um, brought into crisis the uh, chariot warfare that in fact e even in, in the Celtic world, surprise surprise, survives all in those areas that as we've seen were less militarily developed generally speaking. Right in, in central Gaul, you don't find chariots uh, when Caesar was fighting against them. Uh, in Britain, the Romans found that, and that was, however, already kind of the heavier type of cha of chariot that had somewhat evolved from the lighter one. It was more widespread in more archaic times. 
Um, so um, another thing that is often that is interesting to say at least that Levy calls uh, the Celtic formation effectively as a testudo, right? So the Roman tortoise uh, formation. Um, why? Because surprise, surprise, every single people who had a shield, <laughs> you know, historically speaking, when targeted, brought the shield over their heads, right, and enclosed in it, right? So the testudo is not a Roman prerogative. Everybody who has studied uh, just a minimum of Roman military history knows, in fact, about this passage from Levy. And, um, yeah, also, actually, that should be better explained, that the studio is not really a, a formation as such. It's just a setting when you're caught then in the open under fire, you have no better way to do but just bringing the shield over you. So it's not actually an effective formation. Um, it, it's, it's not a formation proper even and it's not even designed for fighting aside from what you see in movies where people engage at the studiness well it's it's disgusting um, but um, what what seems to the, the Celts did in this regard was to protect themselves from this hail of let's say Pila for example as we've seen now and then eventually losing up in, you know, in a wild charge when the Romans discharge, so trying to meet them, it's not such a you know. Uh, this is a bit of a mechanistic explanation because you you don't often have the necessity of, or even an advantage of doing that, especially if you want to counter charge effectively. Um, we know how lethal uh, a well delivered uh, pila um, throw, a co coordinated one, was done, especially in attack. Um, but the idea in this regard was to bog down en en enemy sh charges that were counter-attacking in that, that very moment. And the whole thing is also much less systematic than we think. It's not that the Romans, many people b believed that the Romans basically used the, to throw Pila in, in the concerted collective fashion e before every attack ever. This is actually not true. There is very few evidence in this regard that shows us that this uh, javelins were used fundamentally, yeah, in that situation if you had really a very well um, um, cohesive and drilled uh, units in a s specific tactical situation, but you know, Pila could be used in many other ways even just for skirmishing or even as as lanks as, as, as spears as a matter of fact um, and uh, it didn't happen all the time that this um, salvo would be delivered but aside from this, the same Celts used um, um, javelins, as we will see now. Just a last word about this defensive formation that is somewhat attributed to the Gauls and that can be explained. The same Levy says uh, that the Gauls maintained a close order at the Battle of Centinum, especially in the last stages of the battle, when they were thrown on the defensive. So, um, at the same time, in the same situation, it seems that the Celts charged in fairly close order, too, which means that they weren't the, you know, uncoordinated, completely dis the disciplined uh, and training less barbarians would break the formation every time they moved, like in every time they sneezed. Um, uh, but secondly, it's fascinating that this, um, uh, there is a sort of defensivistic uh, resort when in fact the the first charges has been re repelled right um, as we've seen before after the first charge most of resources were spent so the best thing you could do at that point is by leaving the initiative to the enemy because you're you had fucked up um, anyway um, it was to resort to this very thick order to resist to the end right so that fits with all the things we've said before about the fighting to the death Right. In fact, um, the uh, in that on that occasion, the uh, the the, the, the Samnites, for example, were fleeing the battle in in next to them, and they remained firm, uh, which is very interesting. Um, in so the impression is actually that the Celts probably had fairly more functional melee infantry that we can think of, even in their somewhat tactical organization, even. If they were fundamentally still not particularly different from other tribal peoples. Um, 
what seems that uh, also had created problems to them was um, rough t terrain, right? For the cohesion of their formation, this is normal for for all formations, but definitely those who lack more collective training have greater problems with it. As we've seen, uh, we've said before, the Galatians especially proved helpless in mountain country in Greece or at home in 189 BC. Um, and as we have also said, some tribes living in the hills naturally fought better in such terrain, right? Think about Hannibal, um, when he basically had to pass from Gaul to, um, to, to Italy, um, passing through the Rhone Valley. And he attacked these alpine tribes who, according to historians, came swarming down the rock in precipitous slopes, sure-footed as they were from, a, uh, from long familiarity with their wild and trackless terrain. Right? Um, yeah, oh, there, there is true that the Romans uh, fought also bitterly on several occasions with this alpine, let's say, either Celt or, or somewhat better Celticized populations that were pretty well at ease fighting on the mountains, but it, that's also to say what is an alpine society like? That they're some of the most poor and primitive and, and wildest and more isolated ones that is they, they have to resort to fight on, on the mountains to, to, to achieve some success. I'm mean, not kidding in this regard. Um, similarly, it seems that the tribes of uh, Cisalpine Gaul, that is basically north of Italy, it means the goal from this side of the Alps, from a Roman perspective, were enough at home in what was at the time um, substantially forested and swampy country in the Po Valley um, to stage um, successful ambushes like it uh, by, for example, felling trees was, was a common tactic to form these barrages, for example, like it happened um, uh, against a Roman army in the Silva Litana, the uh, Litana forest, in uh, 216 BC. Um, however, these are tactics that basically every people can perform, right? If they know the terrain, and yeah, th this is fairly normal. But it's somewhat more fascinating to concentrate on, you know, the um, Celtic tactics for what concerns the open country, because objectively the Celts did participate in many large-scale battles in which they had the, the guts to face, you know, uh, in open ground, some of the, you know, toughest armies uh, of their times. Um, so another cliche is that the Celts were vulnerable to enemy skirmishers, because objectively it seems that uh, Weapons like, like especially slings and bows, were weren't that um, that widespread in Celtic warfare. Um, this is probably true in the sense that the Celts retained uh, over time this sense of um, free manhood uh, that ha that also corresponded to a certain type of fighting, like face to face, uh, uh, hand to hand. Um, in in the open, so they were normally spearmen, like the these the like in all tribal society, the, the greatest, uh, the most important weapon, also religiously sacredly uh, speaking, is the spear because it's it's the symbol of the of the average freeman because these are f relatively um, I mean egalitarian societies in the sense that they are very oligarchic in some ways as we've seen, but in origin especially they they were fairly not much stratified, right? And it wouldn't be on average also in, in later times. So it's the idea of the people, of the bulk of the freemen that can oppose um, this wall of spears and that have a sacred value. The same goes for the Germans that literally take their names and the one of the army and the war associated to the spear, which is a um, German, that, that's, that's the point. It's like Gaisata, you know, the, the Indo-European et etymologies are always there, always the same. So there are deep, um, deep uh, connections in this regard, but also deep similarities between fairly simple societies that all resemble each other. So yes, probably the Gauls uh, relied heavily on this bulks of heavy, of, of infantry in general, um, and 
possibly, and this is showed later times during after the battle of um of a varicum, if I'm not wrong, when um uh the Vercingetorix uh, calls for all the uh all the bowmen of Gaul, which means that all the other Gauls were basically fighting, but the bowmen, the slingers, these guys were were not and it's been suggested that there was this sort of classist view still, the idea of the conquerors were the guys with spear in the hand, like the warriors that didn't have to work the land, and the regular serfs and other sub subjugated populations were, um, um, you know, were just had this poor weapons, right, and that didn't have the honor to participate regularly to the army, so they had to be called later. Now, this is a very Dumezilian interpretation that, that goes back to the idea that, yeah, okay, the Indo-Europeans arrived, they built some sort of warrior case, and the others were just oppressed, like, it's obviously not like this, but that mention is fairly interesting, because it shows as if, you know, there, there was a part of the population um, that, you know, was kind of more naturally involved in warfare while the others had, you know, kind of subordinate position. Which in Gaul especially is the among the old Celtic world is where you would most likely find, structurally speaking, a society segmented like that. Um but at the same time, uh I, also bows and slings and they're more difficult to find. Um in general. And uh ar archaeologically speaking also they um, they probably don't figure much also in if there was this general ethics revolving around the the idea of uh, single combat face to face engagement i mean it's a bit like in the middle ages even in germanic society i mean we know that that bows were there the slings were there but their art their history didn't want to portray that much because it was kind of cowardly weapon but actually we know that the celts did have some you know, minor numbers of, of bowmen and slingers, and also that on the long run, actually they're um, they they increase their numbers of of um, of javeliners at least. Um, it's as if, especially in these countries like Gaul, as we've seen, I mean, uh, uh, more people will called up to arms, like not the bulk of the conquering tribes of the times of the Celtic migrations, but all a bit the, the people of the countryside, and these were naturally more likely kept. Like the average Celtic war um, uh, warrior would, f for example, have like one or two or even three javelins. Some of them, actually, one was the same spear, in the sense there is no boundary between the javelin and the spear. At a certain point you can use them, and you know, your, your spear in a way that you can also throw and pass into the other one. Um, so aside from this, uh, the tendency is from, starting from the early Latin period, <coughs> excuse me, when the Celts were usually had this massive lances with this very broad and long tip that suggests a very sophisticated and skirmish, that means that the warrior is very skilled and is really a warrior in the true sense of the world, to this kind of peasant militias that had just a normal spear, that they the, they use just to form some you know more or less orderly formation to try to stop minimally some art, but it just made numbers essentially, and that's the tendency that as we've seen before goes also in parallel with the formation of more uh, specifically uh, trained professional units, uh, often belonging to the aristocracy, that have very expansive weapon and armor that they're very numerical and qualitative elite of the Celtic armies, right? Whereas the rest is a bit kind of you know softer, uh, way softer sometimes. Um, whereas uh, I suspect that populations like the, the Belgians or others uh, like the Britons so it were somewhat more like um, in the in the heroic. Um, mindset and would still have a kind of more a closer uh somewhat closer relation with warfare uh, on average than say the goals proper um and also considered that there was um um anagraphic segmentation that is the younger celts normally spent their time uh, skirmishing with javelins, bows, and slings, uh, 
oh, that was very important before the battle because they actually, um, um, you know, gave the time to the army to order itself. Never to underestimate this, that many skirmishes that occurred throughout all warfare are actually uh, buying time for deploying better in a more orderly fashion. Uh, so that these guys that are younger, so they're more, you know, energetic and uh, resilient and elastic and agile, let's say, they, they do this also, by the way, to show their bravery, because they they go out there in the open, they, that's very risky, right, especially cavalry can be a serious threat in that regard, but they, they show their fits, they kind of compete also among each other, there is a ferocious competition, within these groups, these bands, the younger especially have to prove everything um, and to become true men, let's say, in this regard. We did this, sometimes they, they were baptized in this in this sense, martially speaking. Um, yeah, and then eventually they would retreat and maybe keeping to skirmish, but um, and there was probably e eventually also social segmentation that is, this became more than yeah, the youngers, maybe the poorest, right, while the you know the the youngers of the late Latin period uh, noblemen would be maybe elite skirmishers or maybe you know having certain other roles directly in the as uh, fighters uh, you know hand to hand combat preferably. But the the, the missile fire powered Celtic armies maybe has been a bit um, overlooked. Or times, just that we know so few. Once again, that it's not so easy to say. Okay, well, so it is. So as we have seen, this picture of the Celts as wild, ferocious, but somewhat erratic and disorganized, and lacking in tactical sense, um, is is not truly really the truth. It's actually not even so popular among the Greeks and the Romans themselves. I mean. We have to separate the width from which half here. I mean, it, it, the the classical orders were basically true uh, about this. They they didn't they obviously didn't complement much the military intelligence of these populations. But from their perspective, I mean, they were in the position of saying, okay, we are kind of better than them because objectively their their armies, their military cultures were more organized, they, they had a uh, greater uh, sophistication, a military thought, um, all the, the capacities that could naturally even counter these populations. Um, so this is true. From, from the other side, uh, we have to realize, however, that within their possibilities, the Celts were very efficient, right? This is a bit the nutshell of all populations out there like if you fight uh, you're brought in front of such necessities that you can't be just an idiot who goes there by chance and uh, and doesn't realize what he's getting himself into so as you know loosely disciplined as they could be right uh, they still had some essentials that worked fairly they worked well Right, a people that is primitive it that can have a lower military quality, but it's not um, dysfunctional. Right, we have to understand this point. For example, it's very famous the battle of the Alia River in 390 or 386, wherever you want to place the, 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 the chronology, where the, uh, the the Gauls defeated the Romans. Right, and they especially seized. You know. And that is seen as a major victory, but uh, let's say in, in by that time, the beginning of 4th century BC, the Romans still didn't have the army that would become later. I made a video just recently about this. So they were actually transitioning towards what would become, uh, actually were transitioning through those stages that we somewhat uh, stereotypically associated to the so-called Servian and Chameleon reforms that didn't absolutely happen with the chronological order that are traditionally re reported by the Romans themselves, but I mean, they, they weren't this great, um, uh, you know, military machine yet, nor, as we've seen, also very different from the Gauls. So, yeah, Brennus, that is this generic name for Gallic uh, military leaders, just for the record, um, was pretty smart at that point. The Romans concentrated 
their I mean they deployed on on one actually possibly two battle lines if you read Levy carefully um, and they settled uh, they, they brought this reserve basically on on a hill that was on their right flank and Brennus understood perfectly what they did and he concentrated uh, troops on his left and he overwhelmed he assaulted the hill and basically he got rid of the of the possible Roman outflanking maneuver, but he also broke the, uh, he you know discovered the, uncovered the, uh, right Roman flank, and so the, the Roman army basically broke throughout. So now okay, they outgeneral the Romans, but okay, it, it's a so sound intuition. This still doesn't mean there was such a great tactical sophistication behind it. I mean, it's a great choice, is a great. Uh, capacity but still within the boundaries of uh, you know warfare that still um, swings among certain uh, frequencies that they're not so sophisticated um, at the Battle of Telamon which is very much more interesting the Allied Gallic army caught uh, between two fires by the, uh, the Romans uh, displayed somewhat a greater organization is very interesting instead basically it formed up calmly and in good order facing both directions from which the Romans would come in a position which greatly in impressed the the Romans actually also because the Celts in that situation began to uh, to shout to chant like and, and it's as if they they sent their uh, you know the the sound of this cry came from within the earth itself. That is, the 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 cows with this shout were re reawakening the the forces of the underground. It was terrifying from a religious point of view. But especially in that situation, the Romans were terrified, quote famously, by the fine order of the Celtic host, right? Uh, and the interesting thing in, in here, so th that's a pretty clever, uh, it was a double order battle, right? Basically, they were deployed on, on two lines, uh, on the two uh, fronts, respectively, in which they, they coped with the, with the enemies. So that is fascinating. We don't know how much that was dictated by, uh, you know, internal also, because the, these different, these four lines that were formed, hence, also were composed by different peoples. Uh, within the Celtic army, so we don't know, but you realize that in there is always it's also politics that plays a, a, an enormous deal. Um, and uh, at the Telamon, also the Celts didn't. Um, um, they, uh, you know, they, they, though being almost cut to pieces towards the end when things were going wrong for them, again they held their ground equal to their foes in courage uh, the sources say uh, and most died where they stood so also in here the first uh, waves of attacks had failed um, so what they do they they go back in defense and they get massacred to to the last again takes a big deal of moral uh, strength to, to do that as we have seen, they showed their similar determination at Centinum, while they're being abandoned by Semitic allies that had fled, which proves that they had tough nerves and they they even knew how to accept, uh, you know, the, not just defeat, but even, you know, how to remain in in, in place where you know uh, things went wrong, tactically speaking, which require does require. A certain amount of of discipline of control. Um, so, in fact, this idea, this stereotype that barbarian is just a wild charger and is uh, irrational, etc., doesn't render justice to the, I mean, to to the great preparation that that fury actually is um, is con is is conceived for, right? The, um, that 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 requires. Um, I mean, you have to use that fury when it's needed. That is to attack, which is what uh, these guys, as we've seen, were largely obliged to do because of their um, other strategical shortages, chiefly. Um, so, uh, 
but when this is not the case, when you need to defend still, well, you enter in another mood for which you have prepared somewhat equally at the end of the day because you have to deal with this situation, you have to do it with cold blood after all and and this proves that these guys were were capable of it right it's and, and they're a bit the the two faces of a same metal in my opinion that is rarely explored and that actually speaks for for populations that had their own degree of order and um and coordination and organization after all that it doesn't have to be confused as you know the wild incapable barbarians right it, it's completely wrong well let's talk about cavalry because um, the Celts and especially the Gauls had a true passion for cavalry and they um, they especially Gaul being very fertile having this large um, capacity of horse breeding and fielding especially big amounts of cavalry but there is a misconception here that is being fueled by also an improper um, reading uh, of of Roman sources that were trying to to show they had capable enemies in front of them uh, because it was partly true but the idea is that uh, even though the Gauls had this end uh, you know, endless passion for horses, and they could uh, deploy a lot of cavalry uh, without collective training. Generally, uh, this cavalry had a rather low quality, and this is what we have to come to terms as well, right? Because once again, those who try to stress that these were somewhat heroes or whatever, uh, because it's it's their team. Um, it say ah oh, no because cavalry Celtic cavalry was so powerful was so great would no right uh, it was pretty low in quality Hellenistic cavalries were hell of cavalries uh, even as we've seen part of Roman cavalries were other people populations were famous for it the Celts the Gauls especially had a lot of cavalry it could be good especially if it was if it was commanded by a, a, a capable uh, leader. Uh, the knew how to employ it, etc. Uh, the same goes for the infantry, as we have seen before. But once again, without collective training, the average of this cavalry was low. And even in here, there is nothing to do about it. Leave or take it, right? Uh, you don't have to believe me, forcefully. But if we consider that there is a special cavalry for no reason, just because it belongs to a people, we don't take consideration even factors as, as collective training what the hell were we talking about in the first place right um, I mean even the Germans did better than uh, than than the goals on horseback when they were given the the Roman horses by Caesar right at the Lazio they, they did largely made so the Germans had even less collective training uh, at that point uh, than, than the goals it was just a matter of combativity at that point and it prevailed Right, so that doesn't speak for a very good collective quality of cavalry. What what do the Roman sources mean when they look at Gallic cavalry and they say, "Wow, this is a thing"? Well, they they obviously see that still, even if you don't have a big deal of collective training, if you have to fight against lo masses of horsemen that can outflank you and can do what what whatever cavalry can do, well, that's a problem, especially if you have a few cavalry, as the Romans did on average but still that doesn't prove the intrinsic quality of Celtic cavalry by itself and once again this has nothing to do with the individual promise I'm sure that the average Gallic cavalryman was a, was a hell of a rider but once again as a unit that's a wholly different thing right um, and cavalry would deploy on the flanks, usually open the battle by charging the enemy horse with spear and sword, perhaps throwing javelins on the way in, right? There were, even here, cavalry was somewhat segmented, uh, just like in the infantry, the elite, uh, the armor of the elite was pretty scarce, uh, but powerful, right? Um, and naturally, we, we find Celtic cavalry doing whatever, whichever other, other cavalry can do, raiding, scouting, ambushing enemy scouts, blockading enemy camps, seizing K hills, exploiting uh, speed, right? Um, and as we've seen before, though, in spite 
the Celts liked horses so much. It's, it's also reflected in their in their cults that are somewhat heterogeneous, but they reflected. Um, they they didn't have to fight on horseback forcefully, right? It was not cent for cent the norm, especially if we are taking really the broader picture of the Celtic world. As we have said before, who fought on horseback was potentially the the guy who could flee the battlefield, right? Sometimes, if the people of these tribes was particularly strong, it could happen like it happened for the Germans as well in other contexts that they would the, the, the spear, I mean, the infantry would began to shout, telling the, the the nobility to dismount to share the destiny with them, right? And preferably, in fact. These guys would fight on foot, and there are actually, uh, you know, that there is evidence that the nobility also put up this this fight to 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 the death by dismount, right? The goals, as we have seen, it were mostly about infantry. After all, um, they dismounted even as far as, for example, at the Battle of uh, Mount Magaba, was in Asia Minor against the Romans. Um, and uh, in some contexts that go declining over time, chariots usually supported the cavalry, right? Um, what I said before, uh, a bit uh, temporarily speaking, is that Central Europeans abandoned. The, this, it's as if they didn't have chariots. They did have it, right? Uh, it's hard to tell when chariot warfare, I mean, disappeared to the last. We even find, I don't know, in... Uh, Celticized places like the Danubian areas, where after the Romanization, local I don't know, uh, Celto-Roman governors that still buried themselves uh, with with chariots. Right? It's a discovery in Croatia. I think it happened uh, last year. Um, that that speaks for itself, right? Uh, but that that that's very symbolic, and at the same time, um, it. it the, the chariot, as we we have said, tends basically to disappear uh, and to be relegated to the northernmost areas of the Celtic world. They were, as we've seen, less developed, generally speaking, the less at least updated. Um, chariots usually supported the cavalry, right? At Centinum, the Celtic chariots were in reserve behind the horse, right? At at the battle. At the Elephant Battle of 273, they started behind the horse, but advanced through them to open the battle, right? While a Telamon, with a cavalry, uh, engaged separately, the chariots covered the flanks of the infantry. Now, these are all different contexts and different employments. Now, the the idea is is that, as you, as we were saying before, chariot warfare had declined since the you know with with essentially with the beginning of the Iron Age in, in many areas. Um, and uh, it, it generally saw the, uh, the reduction in number of, of chariots because essentially against tougher infantries they, they couldn't break. In, um, and however, they, they, began, they, they got bigger, right? So that the, the ideal was this naturally restricted even the, the terrain in which they could be employable. But the idea is that you launch this mass of, 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 of the chariot. Um, here it doesn't matter whether it's a horse, a, an elephant, or a chariot. I mean, the concept is always the same. Um, and you have to do it fairly well. And, and still, um, this uh, systematization mostly happened in places like Mesopotamia, where it's s somewhat still so the continuation of chariot warfare, even under the Seleucids, right? But it was a much more reduced and exceptional thing. As far as I understand, um, chariot warfare instead maintained this kind of more um, scattered, let's put it in this way, use. Like if you see populations like the Celts, especially in Britain, or the Garimantians in North Africa, like the idea is, is that the chariot is as this, you know, present, right, uh, dispersedly in, in this world, um, than having just a set of chariots that you use as a tactical army in a major encounter. That is to say, here is basically all the, the various clans that all have a ship and that has a, still a chariot, right? This means that in battle, there's going to be lots of chariots that are controlled by different commands, right, and therefore they 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 may operate all together, and they did, 
uh, too. Think about when the Romans were had to flee in Britain when they were uh, foraging, and you know that this Briton chariots and cavalry appeared. Uh, yes, because the Britons had cavalry as well, just in case you thought it, it, they didn't. But there is this eternal stereotype that Britain didn't have much. It, it is true, right? Britain wasn't much good for cavalry, but in general. Even the Anglo-Saxons, but it's not that they didn't use cavalry. That that is a myth. Um, the um, so the idea is that a chariot would be used more flexibly in those contexts. That is, it, it retained a little bit its kind of more skirmishing function, rather than so this hit and run tactics, rather than the uh, smashy thing that uh, like a bowling ball that you know was conceived like on the flatlands of Syria in the hands of the uh, of the Seleucids and this massive chariots, enormous things to launch at maximum speed. Um, naturally, it could be dangerous as well. I mean, uh, there were uh, seated chariots as well. Uh, they were used by the Galatians. That was a bit of an update of possibly also Hellenistic use, but at least later Roman sources say that even in Britain, they, the, the chariots had the scythes. Um, that is not the most important thing. That, that The most important thing is how you use the chariot in the first place, and and the idea, as as we ever said, is that the chariot would usually skirmish. Uh, chiefly, um, it's difficult to tell. Many people say it's chiefly against enemy cavalry. Um, which, yeah, I mean, it's possible. But it was useful also against infantry, especially getting very close to it and throwing these javelins at it. Um, which, uh, you know, it's still this thing that, uh, especially a chieftain, that is usually the guy who is in on them, or no, knows how to do. I mean, the, this idea that, that, that the Celtic uh, nobleman is skilled, really, um, with all these various uh, arms, and that is normal to, in, in this individual value uh, level of training, that, uh, that they he must use must know how to use every single weapon. I mean, if Vercingetorix had, fa you know, a fought with Caesar uh, at a duel, probably very likely, you know, he would have got the f by far the better. Because that's the point we were saying before: it's about the individual training versus collective training, generally speaking. Um, knowing how to throw a javelin is still a very important thing to do, after all, and it's something you do from the chariot uh, as well, as we've seen on, on other contexts um, you know and, and after you have skirmished by the way uh, you can try if you have softened uh, up enough the enemy formation you can try to to actually charge right it's hard to um, to charge an infantry and break it right it's very rare you have really to to be in pretty dire conditions to achieve a victory, because here infantry is pretty damn resilient, and uh, as we have seen, even the Celts had this pretty defensively functional infantry, so that was hard. But the idea is that yeah, maybe a flank attack, why not? And trying to break with the with the mass of the chariot and passing through. And and if you think that uh, in other battles, I mean, the order could be more open sometimes, and that also most of Celtic warfare was about uh, skirmishes, raids, etc. But we see that in that context, the, the chariot acquires um, proportionally higher importance because you can't run into you know a bunch of twenty people, let's say, uh, let's assume, right, and scatter them and throwing javelins at a greater. Uh, you know, and at them while you go back and forth, or you can, in fact, dismount and fight against the enemy force and then jump on the chariot once again. We have to think it was pretty damn dynamic and pretty damn functional, and also uh, these guys were pretty damn skilled at doing what they did. Once again, individual value, it was pretty freaking high, right? And especially, I don't know, a Briton, a Britonic chieftain would have been massively skilled. I mean, think about, as we were saying before, about the uh, the athletical skills that are needed to do something like that. And that makes you understand how even exposed to this, continu th to this continuously they were, how constantly trained, how bred, uh, if you want, in this mindset they, they were. And the uh, most ferocious competition that existed also between the various, because was the chieftain anyway, is this the best warrior that emerges from the band that leads the others, right? It's a uh, constant um, iron arm between uh, some of the fiercest uh, warriors of the ancient world. Um, 
At the Battle of Centinum, chariots actually charged successfully home against Roman infantry, but only when the, these had been thrown into disorder by the rout of their own cavalry. Um, so this is interesting because there is a cooperation between you know, chariots and cavalry at the same time. And, and this reveals also the important, uh, I mean, the, the shock and also missile effect combined probably of, of Celtic cavalry after all. But it's unlikely, as we've seen, that chariots would charge infantry who stood firm. Uh, at the elephant battle, the conventional light chariots were placed on the wings, and only seated vehicles were in the center intended to break up the formation of the enemy infantry. So that's the example I was talking about before that shows you pretty well how the Galatians that now have lived for quite uh, for almost one century in Asia Minor have essentially developed two types of chariots. One is still the, the old Celtic one um, and that is lighter and more apt to skirmish, right? Things that in those places had declined since the, the, the I mean the time of the Bronze Age. Uh, the other one is kind of the updated Hellenistic model that you you actually deploy deploy in the front line, but it could be also deployed on the wings to smash into the enemy lines directly, right? To to break up the formation of the the enemy center that is usually the toughest one. So that is fascinating. Um, another characteristic of the Celtic armies, especially the ones of the, the of the peoples that were migrating, were often accompanied by large numbers of wagons, as you understand. Um, we're talking about uh, the Celts still moving in large masses. Think about the boy that still at the times of the Gallic Wars were, you know, crossing uh, Europe uh, all together. And we could even appreciate the order of that population in that regard. Um, and there wasn't a, a, a logistical efficiency tied to it, right? So these were not just the military bands or a mega raiding party like the one of the brought to the to the sack of Rome. Um, here we're talking about the entire people on the march, right? And that's how the Celts largely moved, especially at the beginning of this period. Um, and as this migrating peoples, um, it was typical to use the wagons in a, forming a lager behind the battle line, where, by the way, all your women and children were. So that's something you have to defend to the death. That is something the Germans did as well. Um, and remember here the idea is that you 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 don't let yourself and your family being taken alive making made slave right so uh sometimes we're talking about very f ferocious resistance um at the battle of telamon these wagons are found on the flanks probably as a barrier against the out outflanking rather maneuver rather than intended to advance along with it with the chariots right um so that uh, that is normal actually and this idea also deploying wagons in positions which they can even halt partially the, uh, the, the the route, discourage it, blocking the way or maybe forming this sort of fort or camp, fortified camp within the arm. Yeah, it uh, was often done, it was a thing, it actually still done. Like, in look at places like the desert, uh, all these uh, pickups, you know, deployed like a circle or square sometimes when they stop still with in modern warfare right so yeah and uh, I think we have covered most of what we could I think I have talked about the, the essence of this um, if you think that we haven't focused on weaponry ju just know that um, we will do it in movies uh, yeah in movies in <laughs> I'm yeah, um, in videos that will be dedicated to specifically to that. Like I have already made a video, if I'm not wrong, about the Celtic nobleman equipment or something like that. And I will be uploading about Celtic warfare. I've created a playlist, so you're interested. If you're interested, it's all about um, medieval warfare, right? And I will be uploading, generally speaking, because we'll cover all these topics at once. If I, you know, if we go on.
and um, yeah and I want to be very clear when I make this video so just think everything I say I, I mean it very seriously and I try really to do my best to making actually one video a day so I could prepare these better I, or I know but uh, that's also what brought me to expand a bit faster um, in last times and I, I think that some topics we, we discussed here are somewhat not so popular in the sense that yeah everybody can make a video on how was a Celtic warrior equipped but let's say getting a bit more into the cause of its internity I think is healthier if anything to understand what what the uh, who these people were and also why certain criticism that we addressed before is easily debunked Right here, we're not once again making videos about different peoples and individuals because those are our uh, our heroes. Right here, we're trying to make sense of the past, which is a very different thing, um, which is history as a wall. Right. So once again, I also make my best telling you to highlight the. Um, I mean, sometimes the worst of a culture, but generally speaking, I mean, we are all pretty bad as humans in a certain way homogeneously from the other hand I try to also to highlight the, the positive aspects of this I mean preferably right so that people would at least I, I always try to be f stern but fair right if I, I give what I think it's, it's due to, to these uh, worlds to these uh, peoples I uh, obviously I fail because we can't portray them satisfactorily by the slightest but at least on the base of our historical awareness in so far we have to be concrete and realistic and not um, you know letting us uh, ourselves taken carried away but by you know this idea that we have to uh, you know to push this ideology because it makes us feel us feel better also actually makes us feel worse right we, we whoever uh, idealizes history and needs to find the uh, ah, the ultimate point the ultimate uh, how how can people make a living about getting fixated on a certain specific people and just pretending they're the best and that there are others that are the worst and not I mean getting into the beauty of history that is all that lays in the middle and that gives you a much better depth and perspective and in understanding about this whole even where we don't have the explicit realization of it well at least that's that's what history is the rest is just it's not a history as a matter of fact but I will get my share of haters for these words I know um, anyhow I uh, just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channels if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you Herkley for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye